All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the stream. I hope everybody is doing well tonight. We are getting started way early tonight just because I want to make some good progress and get some stuff knocked out. Uh, and so I figure, why don't we just get started early and we have more time to stream, more time to do stuff, right? So before we jump into that, though, I do want to take just a quick second and thank the supporters of the channel. Starting with the partners who are the highest tier of subscription over on Patreon and YouTube memberships. Those are Gabby Bashir and Gerboles Inc. I would also like to thank all the other supporters listed here. Uh, they are a combination of the other tiers on Patreon and YouTube memberships, as well as Twitch subscriptions. So thank you all very much for your support. I greatly appreciate it. Of course, uh, I hope you guys realize that uh, without you, uh, the viewers, uh, none of this would exist. This channel wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be able to do this project, or at least it wouldn't have the traction that it does. Um, and so I, I really appreciate all of you uh, who hang out with me here on the stream, either on the Twitch side or on the YouTube side. We do simulcast of both. Uh, so I appreciate you guys being here, um, either here, whether you're watching it after the fact or whatnot. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. So thank you very much. Okay, so last time we were sort of in the middle of uh, trying to figure out the remainder of our issues with our hierarchy and our X-Form system and getting a scene to load up properly. Um, and I went ahead and did uh, a little bit of stuff offline just to kind of make a little bit of progress with that because we spent a lot of time debugging last time. And I kind of wanted to, to get uh, get moving uh, forward a little bit quicker, a little bit a little bit faster, right? So um, I went ahead and resolved some issues offline. That's uh, what we're looking at here. I've got a diff pulled up um, with some changes that I made. So uh, we're going to step through this really quickly. There's not a lot of code here. It was mostly just changing variables around, right? Um, I didn't have to add like a lot of logic um, really at all. It was just kind of um, changing the way things uh, passed around different sets of data in some cases. So um, one of the first things that I changed was I started messing around with the test scene two um, KSN file. And then I remembered um, off the top of my head, we aren't actually parsing this yet. Um, so this is actually not going to be um, visible right away until we actually hook this up um, to uh, level loading. But uh, all that being said, um, you know, we do have a small update for that. Uh, the hierarchy graph had a couple of small bugs in it. Um, in some cases we were um, actually performing the uh, local calculation against the node handle instead of the X form handle. So we were just using the wrong handle there. Um, so I fixed that. Um, and then uh, we had a couple of these uh, arrays in ensure allocated that had copy pasta issues. So I fixed those. Uh, the geometry 3D um, within the ray cast hit, which is what we use when we um, click on the scene to uh, select an object. Uh, we actually needed a little bit more information there. Um, and I hadn't quite thought it all the way through yet, but uh, what we have is uh, we have a node handle and we have an X form handle for the object that's selected. Uh, but what I'm also going to pass along with it is the uh, X form of the parent uh, and maybe even the node um, of the parent. And the reason for that is, is because we actually uh, ran into an issue that was pre-existing in the scene um, when dealing with uh, with parented objects. And we'll get into that um, here in just a minute as well. So uh, that is to resolve that issue. Um, and then we, uh, in our scene loader, I just tweaked some of the properties here um, and just uh, essentially moved up this position, right? And the reason for that is because the tree is a, um, is a child of the Sponza object, which has a really small scale factor on it. Um, and so we needed to bump these properties up quite a lot uh, basically to compensate for that so that we actually see that, right? Because when we uh, multiply those matrices together, these values get scaled by that. Um, and uh, that was essentially causing it to have almost no effect whatsoever. So we went ahead and fixed that. Uh, let's see. Tamman, how's it going? Yes, early stream. Yep, we're getting an early start. Um, I wanna definitely uh, knock some things out tonight and make a lot of good progress. So that's kind of the... Uh, Kind of the object here, right? Uh, LTO, good to see you. Uh, <laughs> this was too early. Yep. Yeah, I mean, um, we are starting early tonight. We're, this is not a normal thing for us to start this early. We're actually starting almost, uh, well, I guess it's about two and a half hours ahead of time. So, um, yeah. 
Hoping I accomplished lots of stuff tonight. Uh, Smudge, good to see you. How's it going? Nearly good afternoon. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that means a longer stream. Yep. Yeah, so I'm going to stream to the normal time tonight, right? So we're going to have a long stream today. Uh, from Lake, great time for you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, normally I can't start this early, but today, today we are. Um, Kirk, good to see you. How's it going? All right. So, um, a couple of other tweaks we made were in the scene itself. Um, I did a, a lot of, uh, variable renaming in here. So a lot of these changes in this diff were actually just that, um, things like typed attachment. I renamed it to typed attachment config because config is what we're dealing with here, not the actual attachment that's further down. Um, I did things like rename index to resource index just to make things a little bit more descriptive. I may do a little bit more of that tonight, um, but that is uh, most of what is in here. Uh, the other thing that we did was there were a couple places in here where we were we were using um, the scene mesh attachment indices sub i when we should have just been using sub i, right? So in this case, uh, let me expand this a little bit. In this case, when we're doing a scene raycast, um, and we are, wait a minute, did I expand the right section? Yes. So when we um, are doing a scene raycast um, and uh, anywhere else, we're, we're essentially looping through meshes, right? Uh, the, the mesh array, the mesh attachment indices and the mesh attachments are all the same um, index, right? So uh, all of those things should line up. And so uh, that is, uh, just fixing that mistake. And we've did that, I think, two other places in the file, um, maybe more. Uh, the other uh, change in here um, is kind of what I mentioned before, where we needed that X form uh, parent handle. Uh, and this is where we need it. So if we have an object that is uh, parented to another object, then there's a scale applied to that parent object. Um, the movement of both the um, the gizmo itself, as well as the child object, when you actually try to move it, was incorrect if you don't take the scale of the parent's world matrix into account. So um, what this does is it uses that handle to go ahead and, and grab the, um, the parent index. Um, and then from that, uh, we're able to grab the X form um, and uh, use that uh, to, to get the, the data that we need, right? Um, and so uh, this is providing that when we do the raycast, when we pick the object, we say, hey, if it has a parent, include this information along with that selection set uh, so that we have it on the other side when we need it. Um, more index updates, uh, more renaming. Um, and then uh, this is another resource uh, index uh, update there. Uh, the H file, I just added a couple of comments in there. Um, I actually moved mesh attachments down to be with these other, uh, the meshes and the, and the mesh attachment indices. I'm probably gonna do that for all of the rest of these as well. Um, the editor gizmo had quite a few uh, little bug fixes in it. Um, the biggest ones were around um, changing from transforms to export positions, um, using the world and world position um, to set the X form position. Um, and then uh, let's see, the we also are setting the scale um, to make sure that that's zero in some cases, right? Because um, I just want to make sure that the um, that the X form or the uh, the gizmo X form never has a scale of anything other than one, at least for now, right? So we're just setting that to be sure about that. Um, the other thing is is when we do our editor gizmo selected transform set. Um, that initially took a X form handle. Now it also takes the parent handle, right? So it includes uh, that parent handle in the selection set information. Um, in addition to that, uh, the editor gizmo update also does a calculation or a recalculation of the uh, X forms um, or the gizmos X form on every frame, just to make sure that it's uh, up to date. We should probably do a dirty check here, but for now I'm just doing it every frame, right? Um, we can always optimize that stuff later. Um, the next bit is we were doing, um, uh, we were using the world um, 
transformation matrix for the gizmo and the, the gizmo is never a child of anything. So it never actually gets a world matrix recalculated for it. So that was actually wrong. We should be using the local one instead. So we're doing that. Um, and then uh, we just kind of moved some code around just to kind of get rid of some repeated stuff, moved it towards the top of uh, various sections so that we didn't have the same calls going on to stuff. Um, and then this is the section where we take the um, parents transform into account. So um, in the editor gizmo, when we're handling an interaction, specifically of the movement type, when we're actually moving that, um, we now say uh, if there is a parent, uh, a valid parent handle, um, we then say, okay, well, let's get the uh, world matrix from that. Let's get the scale from that. And then uh, we're going to inverse that scale so that we can um, apply the, the opposite transformation to that. Um, so that's just taking um, one and dividing uh, each, uh, or dividing that one by each uh, of the scale components, which if you know matrices is zero, five, and 10. Um, eventually we should probably have some sort of convenience function for this, but for now I'm just doing it in line. So um, we either use that or we just use a flat out one scale. Um, and the selected world scale um, is then applied to um, the translation uh, of the object um, below. So um, we go ahead and we save off the scaled translation and then we um, say the selected X form, let's, let's translate that by the scaled translation. Um, the gizmo itself um, just receives the normal translation in space, right? So this is just to account for that issue, which we weren't accounting for before. Um, that's now fixed an issue that we didn't even realize was there right away because we, we didn't really have a tiered scene before. Um, the rest of this is just sort of removing repeated code. Um, and I think uh, just variable renames the rest of the way down. Um, with the exception of a X form calculate local um, at the end of uh, the handle interaction. So we're technically doing it here and on the update, we probably don't need to be doing both, but I am doing both right now just to make sure that we're, we're never out of date. And then we can always uh, play around with that later and, and see um, you know, if we need to uh, adjust that. But this is for an editor gizmo. I don't think this is gonna be a performance bottleneck, so I'm not really too worried about it. Uh, the other thing that we did, that we did, is uh, we created a a small uh, function just to get the editor gizmos model matrix, um, which really just returns the uh, the local matrix for um, its X form handle. Uh, and the reason that we use the local again is because the editor gizmo is not ever parented or a child of anything, right? So. Um, to avoid confusion externally due to that, um, we just wrap that in this, this function and then whatever is actually um, trying to interact with the gizmo or uh, or needs its, uh, its model matrix uh, should just call this function to avoid that, right? Um, so if we have a gizmo, then we return uh, this X form local. If we don't um, have a gizmo here, uh, just to avoid any sort of crashing or anything like that, we just return a uh, identity matrix, right? So uh, that is that. Um, the editor gizmo header file uh, just had a selected X form parent handle added to that list, um, and then a couple of signature changes. Um, the last thing is the game state uh, that holds the selected object also has the X form parent handle uh, tied to that. So that's part of the selection data that the application has. Um, Editor render graph, um, we were actually doing a X form world get on the gizmos uh, X form handle, which was wrong, right? So now we're just using, um, we're, we're doing a calculate local, which we probably don't need to do. Um, but then we are also um, just getting the, uh, the model matrix from that, right? Um, okay, test bed just saw a couple of small updates and we're almost at the end here. In fact, this is the last file. Um, so this is just to copy over uh, the X form parent handle data from the hit data that's given to us um, and then pass that in to uh, select a transform set. Um, and we do that in two places, right? And that is it, right? So we have selection here and deselection here. And that's it. <laughs> um, that is basically what we've done. Uh, let's see. Spiro, thank you for the lurk. How's it going, buddy? G good to see you. 
Um, the resolution is lower than normal, right? 1080, 60 FPS doesn't look 1080. It should be 1080. As far as I can tell. Let me double check my stream settings, but I'm pretty sure I'm outputting to... You might have to explicitly tell it 1080. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm outputting to 1080. 60 frames a second. The code is less sharp than normal. I wonder if... Um, I wonder if it's just just your your internet, maybe? Maybe it's just buffering on your end. Does, is anybody else having issues in terms of like looking at the looking at the code? You're on mobile, but it looks okay on your end. Okay. It may also be because we're um, the uh, the text view of this is smaller than I have my font and my code editor, so that that might be it. Like if I if I zoom in a little bit, that might you know that might make it a little easier. It was a little fuzzy, but needed to, to buffer. Okay. Uh, big bands, Josh, by the way, first time chat. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe that was it. Maybe it was just the font size of, of my browser just being small. Not sure. Okay. Um, we're done with this anyways, so I can actually bat this away. Um, and I was just kind of going through my to-do list here um, in terms of what else we need to do. Uh, before we go any further, though, let me pull down the debugger and run this so you guys can at least see where we're at, right? So I'll load up the scene. And you'll note now that it looks a whole lot more correct, right? Um, we've got our spawns in there. We've got our, our tree in there. Uh, there's, a, there's a few small display issues and things we've got to work out. Um, like the uh, the bounding boxes aren't showing correctly, for example. Um, one of them is absolutely gigantic and huge. You can kind of see its bounds like all the way in the, in the distance. Um, and then the one for the tree is like just chilling here in the middle. Um, so that's definitely not right. We've got a few things to, to resolve there. But what I wanted to point out was uh, if, we, uh, if we go ahead and select um, the Sponza, which is just object ID zero, um, and change the mode to move, and we move this around, we can now see it moves the Sponza and the tree, right? Because the tree is a child of the Sponza object. Likewise, I can select the tree and move it independently, right? So I can actually, um, if I wanted to, uh, I can move the tree over this way, right? Um, maybe move it, let me move it back down a little bit, right? If I wanted to move it out away from the Sponza, for example, um, I can do that, and then I can reselect the Sponza, go into like rotation mode, um, and start rotating the Sponza, if I can select it here, right, and hang on a second, it's a little bit small, this is another issue I need to fix, right, it's kind of hard to actually select and, and, and move and rotate, right. Uh, let me change the camera angle so that we can see uh, the tree. But we can see as, as we rotate that, the tree kind of goes with it, right? So we know that our, our scene hierarchy is working correctly, um, which is what we were, you know, aiming for. So um, now we can start, like, adding back all the other things that we're missing, like the skybox, the terrain, um, the directional light, the point lights, things like that. Um, so, yeah. That is kind of where we're at at the moment. Um, and then once we get that stuff done, um, I think the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start applying the handles uh, to other systems like textures and stuff. Um, but yeah. Uh, let's see. Perhaps you're developing an astigmatism like me. I actually have that as well. Yeah. Um. Portrait of person, first time chat, welcome. Uh, if I may ask, uh, it's okay for an engineer career if I am 25 years old. Do you mean, uh, 
oh, it, is it okay to start an engineering career if I'm 25 years old? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Um, there's no reason you can't. I know people that have started way later in life than that and are just just fine. You know, they're successful as well. So yeah, 25 is definitely not too late to start at all. Um, okay, so let me just uh, go back to the other side here. Um, Mikhail, hello. Um, you had the same issue. You had to explicitly choose the 1080p 60 and it fixed it for you. Okay. Yeah. I've noticed Twitch has done that to me a couple of times too. Like it's, it defaults to that auto setting and it'll tell you that it's on 1080p 60, but it's actually not until you actually explicitly click that option. I don't know what happened, but yeah. Um, been playing around in Kohi, the engine, if the engine is the engine lib and the testbed is the game. Shouldn't platform win 32 C be in testbed and not in the engine? Nope. No, because, um, the platform layer is part of the engine, not the application, right? Um, you could argue that the platform layer could be a plugin, which we might actually do. We might separate that out into a plugin. Um, but that could also get a little bit tricky as well. Right, because loading the plugin without actually having the the explicit platform library is going to be a little bit weird. But yeah, the uh, the platform layer does exist in in the engine, and that's probably where it should be. Okay. Uh, yes, I am on earlier than normal because we're looking to um, make some decent progress tonight. So longer, earlier stream, but also longer stream tonight. Okay. So, uh, the next thing that we need to do, um, and I just had the to do list here. I don't think we'll come back to that later. Uh, let's go to the scene loader and actually let me pull up the the scene file that we're going to be loading. Um, cause I can use this as sort of a, uh, a reference as to what we're setting up here. Um, so what we've done is we have the spawns loading. We have this, the tree loading, which I actually needed to scale up some of these things. So let me actually, um, let me change some of these properties. So it's consistent with what we have in code. So that way when, when we switch over, it'll be seamless. All right, so we'll do, um, what do we have, 80? And then we have uh, 1,400. Uh, I was kind of playing with these values off camera, right? That's how I kind of uh, know what to set them to. Okay, so at least our file is, um, is consistent. All right, so we have um, we have these. I suppose I could throw the falcon in there. Is like another uh, another thing, right? So we can do. Um, we'll probably just go ahead and we'll leave the the tree um, as a child of Sponza, but the falcon we'll do separately, right? So um, let's see. We'll do this after uh, Sponza. So we'll do. Falcon model. Right. Um, so I think the name of it was just going to be Falcon as well. Yep, it is. Um, so uh, let's replace that. Uh, and then I think the Mesh name is also Falcon. Yep. So we'll do that. Um, right. And then we'll also change, uh, we'll say Falcon mesh attachment. And we'll replace those. Right. Um, and then type to mesh attachment. Uh, we're going to rename this to Falcon type to mesh attachment, um, which actually, 
Well, it's slightly inconsistent naming, but that doesn't matter. This code's temporary anyway. Um, Falcon. If I can stop typing the wrong thing. Typed mesh attachment. Um, okay, so we have a, let's see, what did we do for the scale of this guy? 0.35 across the board. Thirty-five. Uh, Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay. Uh, the position of this guy is going to be um, nine point four, and then it's going to be uh, zero point eight on the Y, and then. 14, uh, and these should all be floats. Uh, do we have a rotation on this guy? We do not, okay. So just um, default rotation is fine. And then the Falcon gets added uh, to the global nodes array, all right? So we'll add that in here as well. And the whole purpose of this is basically we're gonna use this code to template out um, when we go to um, when we go to start parsing this file um, and building this out of the tree, this is kind of the template we're gonna we're gonna work with, right? But we're doing it um, just as a reminder. We're doing it sort of in code like this for now to make sure that this works as expected uh, before we move on. So um, we've saved that. Let's build this real quick. I just want to make sure that that this mesh loads in correctly as well. All right, and we'll run. And pull this guy down. All right, so what did we... Unknown attachment type was found in config. This attachment will be ignored. Okay, so what did we... What did we have? So we have Falcon Mesh Attachment Type, Static Mesh. Did we did we accidentally somehow do this wrong? Typed attachment. Oh, we shouldn't be using the typed attachment here. That's what it is. Um, so this should be uh, Nicholas, thank you for the uh, sub on the uh, YouTube side. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. We want to use Falcon Mesh Attachment, not the typed one. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Hello there, bearded coder. How's it going? Um powerful beard indeed yes it's coming along nicely i like it looks like you'll need an editor to test your scenes um and sooner or later yeah uh, instead of hard coding all of the scene yeah so the only reason i'm hard coding the scene right now uh is just to test that uh the configuration tree that i'm building works um separately from parsing this right so once we know that this works, uh, then we're going to hook up the parsing of this, and then we'll we'll do, just be able to load and unload the scene repeatedly, um, in theory, without actually re relaunching the application, and that'll help a lot, right? Um, we're just doing it this way initially to separate the concerns and make sure that this works before we actually start uh, parsing this file. That's kind of the plan. Um, so let's see. So if I wanted a second test bed with different window settings, should you have a second platform Win32C in the engine? No. Um, so what you would do is uh, you would expose the settings that you want to be different between the two, and that should be part of your application config, which we actually have. Um, we're not making huge use of it right now, but uh, eventually we are going to pipe that, app, that uh, application config through a file that looks like this as well. Um, and then it'll just be a matter of a configuration file that you load. 
Um, is your NeoVim IDE based on WSL or Windows PowerShell because I had problems with WSL on NeoVim? So I am doing this through PowerShell, which is ironically launching a command prompt and, and wrapping it around that, which is funny, but yeah. I've not tried to do this through WSL. Um, I just use native Linux when I do Linux dev, pretty much. Okay, um, did I, did I, did I build this? I think I did. All right, so we have ads, speaking of building, cliffhanger. Tamman with a uh, seven stream streak, by the way, appreciate that. So uh, for those of you who are new to the channel um, and or are over on the YouTube side and are not being served ads at the moment, on the Twitch side, we are given ads once every 30 minutes for 90 seconds or up to 90 seconds. So I'd like to pause the stream so that nobody misses any content. Um, and the other thing I do is I put a timer up on the screen so that you guys can actually see um, how long it's going to be before we come back from the ad break. So if you need to take a bio break or hydrate, uh, something along that those lines, uh, you've got time to do that. I highly suggest uh, that you guys do hydrate on these ad breaks as well. Um, it's good for you, right? All right, so we've got about 30 seconds left on ads, and then we can move on. Almost done on ads. All right, and ads are dead. Uh, so, uh, Sal, thank you for the follow. Um, Arvis, thank you for the uh, the tier one subscription. I appreciate that. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Uh, Eseft, first time chat, welcome. Uh, hey, hard to catch you online for me, mostly because of time zones. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, my time zone. Um, or my, my availability to stream is normally not this early, um, just because I have other commitments, right? Um, but yeah, it's it's always good to eventually, you know, or, or once in a while get on uh, at different times so that I can, you know, meet up with, with different folks. Um, and some folks can be included sometimes, right? So I do that as often as I can. Um, Omni, hello. How's it going? Same as ESEFT. Yeah, I get that. I totally get it. <laughs> yeah, Ivo. Uh, yeah, I stream around 4 a.m. your time. Yeah, there's a lot of people on your time zone, actually. <laughs> You're sick of ads? Fair enough. Deserve it after the schooling yesterday. Are you talking about um, uh, Spiro's stream? Which, by the way, if you guys aren't following Spiro, um, I highly recommend that you do. I'm going to give him a shout out because Spiro is a madman and does all kinds of really cool stuff on stream. Um, he is make making a game engine of his own that is in Zig um, and his renderer is done in uh, the browser. Um, and so he interfaces between JavaScript and uh, Wasm and he uses the DOM as his renderer. I kid you not. Um, so yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's pretty cool stuff, so I suggest you follow him if you're not. Um, all right. <laughs> Ivoca, I did not get schooled, no. Technically, I guess... Well, I mean, I guess I was the one doing the schooling, if that makes sense. Um, but not really, right? Uh, we were just mainly talking about design patterns and stuff. <laughs> Spiro got schooled. <laughs> I mean, not really, right? I, I wouldn't say any of us got schooled. It was more like a uh, like a discussion, right? <laughs> oh, that's too funny. All right. Um, so, with that, 
we were going to try and load this, right? So let's see. Let's just make sure that this, this new object loads in. All right, why? What is happening here? Allocate aligned. Well, that's definitely not valid. Hmm. Is there some sort of weird bananery going on with our DRA? So this should be hierarchy view nodes. It is a DRA of those things. That makes sense. So why would the Why would this be seg faulting by chance? Let me try something first, actually. Let me... Let's clean and rebuild. Some stack overflow is happening, yeah. There were some fixes push requests to your DRA. Recently? I know there's one, there is one issue with, um, was it the insert or the pop at? I think it was insert at. There was an issue with that, but I'm not really using that anywhere, so I don't think it's that. Yeah, it's doing the same thing. What's really strange, though... So we do have we do have state because that was an issue that I did fix before. Wait a minute. What is this? Zero, okay. So those two equal, hmm. All right, so I'm wondering if we've got like a, another copy pasta somewhere. Let me see if I can find what you're talking about though. Um, were those push requests Recent. Yeah, I don't see anything in here about that, actually. <laughs> Somebody fixed the typo. <laughs> But that's, um, that's the only relevant thing I see in here, at least. All right, so we're going to have to take a little, little bit of a closer look at this to see what the heck is going on. <laughs> Valid PR, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... That's a big one. That's that's probably the biggest PR in the entire uh, the entire code base. All right, so yeah, <laughs> no friggin' wonder, right? Like our recursion is just pooping itself for some reason. Like, look at that. This scroll bar is like barely even moving. Yeah, totally just blew up the stack. All right, so. Can I can I get to the bottom of this stack? What did we actually, oh, you know what? 
Hold on. I'll bet I did something stupid in here. Um, so let's see. We have the Falcon. We create the X form. We have the attachments, Falcon attachments. Then we create a Falcon mesh attachment. We allocate the attachment data. Grab a convenience pointer to the attachment data. Fill out the resource name. DRA push Falcon attachments, which was created here. And then we push Falcon into that. I don't immediately see anything that's wrong here. Unless I've done something really stupid that I'm just not seeing, which is possible. Let's see. Okay, so it's not that. So I'm thinking it's got to be something when we're processing our roots in the scene. Um, so let's do... Oh, I wish I'd kept that call stack open so I could see where that initiated. Um, let's see, that's probably going to be scene initialize. Because that's where we set up uh, that kind of stuff initially. So scene initialize processes root nodes. Which is just config nodes, right? It's this list here. So I don't think it's going to be that. Scene load initialize, I think is up here. So let's see, um, we get the X form handle, we get the node handle. We process attachments. Okay, we can completely skip that. And then if node children, we get a child count on the node config children. Then we loop through that. Wait a minute. No. Okay. I was just wondering if we were using I in more than one place, but we're not. At least not that I see. So then it calls scene node initialize for the children. Node handle. And then the address of the children sub I. I guess I'm going to need to debug this because I'm not seeing where it's infinitely recursing. Um, so I guess let's put a breakpoint uh, in node initialize. So scene 424. Let's put a breakpoint here and see what we got. Uh, it looks like some point in your tree it runs out of bounds somewhere and causes a crash. Yeah, so well, it was it was infinitely recursing, is what it looked like. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, STD stack trace is pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice if I had that. Um, but, I mean, I can also get the stack trace for my debugger. So there is that. Um, I may wind up actually implementing something like that from scratch. All right, so I'll bring this down. I'll load this up. All right, so this is going to handle the first node, which should have a single child. It does, so we have the tree. Um, so I'm going to skip over this. Right, and then uh, node config. So we're in the tree node config right now. It does not have any children. So that gets skipped over. Then we bounce back out. The current node config that we're in is now Sponza again. Um, it has a child count of one, so we are done with that loop. Then we break back out of that. And then our scene node count is two. So we're on i equals one at the moment, which should be passing config nodes i. So we initialize that node. Um, the node config is the Falcon. Uh, let's see, okay, so it has a single attachment with no children. Okay, so we go ahead and create an X form handle for that and X3, that is what I expected. Uh, the node handle from the hierarchy graph. So that should be index two, which is also what I expected. Um, then we do the attachments. So we do attachment count, there should be one. So we grab the attachment config, which is of type static mesh. Uh, the attachment type is static mesh. We grab the typed attachment, which is has the resource name Falcon. So we do all this mesh creating, mesh load, initialize, all that crap, right? Um, so let's see. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Oh, what a dingus. I reused I, which is bad. I wonder how many times I did that. Um, so I here, it was smart enough technically to rescope this. But I should fix that. Um, so basically this looks through to find a a free slot does not have one. So then it pushes um, it pushes the new mesh data into, let me move this over a little bit so we can see better. Get rid of this guy. Um, so we create a new mesh attachments, grab the resource handle which is index two. Again, that's what I expect. The hierarchy node handle should also be two. That's what I expect. Let me push into mesh attachments. Same thing we've done otherwise. So that looks correct. We had a single attachment. We did not have any children. Okay. So at that point, We are done initializing here. Okay, so we didn't infinitely recurse within initialization. So that's not the issue. Now we're actually going to kick off the scene load. Um, so skyboxes, we'll skip that. We do have meshes. We should have three. We do have three. Um, so we call mesh load on all three of those to 
three, right? We've queued the jobs for those. Um, scene terrains, we don't have any of those yet. So that should be a no-op essentially. Uh, we load the debug grid. Directional lights should also be interesting. So directional light count. Okay, we created the DRA but didn't actually put anything in it, so that's fine. It's going to skip over that. Same should be true for point lights. Yep, so we skip over that. And now we say the scene is loaded. Okay. So it's not it's not the actual initialization, it's not the loading. I suspect if that's the case, it may actually be where we build the hierarchy tree then. So Let's put a breakpoint there. So we have nodes allocated is four. Um, so essentially here again, we only work on root nodes and then we recurse through to get the children. So this first root has a node handle of index zero, right? That makes sense because it's the first node. Has a X form handle of one because it's the second X form that's been created. Remember we create one, the first one that's created is for the gizmo. So that's always gonna be one ahead. Um, and then it does not have any children, but we, I suppose we could put an if around that, right? But, um, well, no, uh, this goes through and looks for nodes that have the parent node ID as its parent, if that makes sense. Um, so the first one obviously doesn't have it. The second one should, which is the tree, which is correct. We do not have a, so the, the parent, which is the Sponza object, or then the, the spawns a node, does not have a children array. So we create that. And then we create the child view node. And then we say build the view tree node children, passing the newly created child as the parent. So we then start that over and check each individual node to say, hey, do you have this parent as your, or the, do you have this ID assigned to you for this parent? So we shouldn't get any results here. We should loop through them all and say, no, we don't have anything. So we kick back out of that. We are now back up one level. Um, and so the parent children still does not have anything pushed to it yet. Uh, let's see. Right. So we go ahead and push the newly created child to that and then boot out. And now we're back at the top level. And we finish up that loop. Let's see, this is allocated Handle index equals zero. Parent indices three. Oh. 
did we not pre-fill the parent indices array with invalid ID? I'll bet it's just zeroed memory and we didn't actually pre-fill that, which is always gonna say, by default, that every node has a parent ID of zero, which is wrong. It should be invalid ID if it doesn't have a parent. I'll bet that's it. Yeah, that's why you use that's why you use variable names other than I or J. Yeah, and I'm actually going to move away from that as well. It's a bad habit of mine that I've had for years, for sure. Uh, let's see. Um, can you send your NeoVim setup in PowerShell? I can actually do one better. Um, so I wrote an article on my website about my NeoVim setup. Um, and there is the link uh, on the YouTube side. I'll do the same thing on the Twitch side if you guys want that. Um, and so that uh, that is a... Um, an article describing what I have set up, what plugins I use, um, what my folder setup is, things like that for Mac, Linux, and Windows, right? So you've got all three in there. Um, and then also um, there's a link in there to the actual Vim config, like the dot file, uh, if, you, if you're interested in that. So you can actually take a look at seeing how I have that configured. Um, Amazing stream so far. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, stars. This is live. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's what the issue is, right? Because this, I think this is where the recursion is happening. All right. So if we go to hierarchy graph um, all the way at the top let's see we have creates um, and then what we have uh, we have ensure allocated I believe right here. So, parent indices, yeah. We're not actually invalidating those things. Um, which actually is surprising that I've gotten away with it this far then. Okay. So essentially what we need to do is loop from the previous count, right? Which would be graph nodes allocated. Loop from that to new node count, which should, get, which should essentially cover uh, the newly allocated memory and blank all those out. So when we do when we do this bit after we assign this, we'll say um, for u32, and um, we'll call this parent index, right? I guess uh, equals uh, graph nodes allocated. Um, and then parent index is less than new node count plus plus parent index, right? Um, and then we'll say graph parent indices sub parent index equals invalid ID. Uh, is this a U32? Yeah, the U32. Okay. And I'm thinking that should fix the problem. Um, 
um, makes sense. You basically try to write to new memory that doesn't exist yet. So what actually happens um, is like our K allocate auto zeros out memory, right? Um, but zero is a valid index or a valid um, ID, right? So I think what's happening is because we're not using invalid ID, we have ads. I'll continue that explanation in a minute <laughs> once ads are up. So for those of you who are new to the channel, um, we get uh, ads once every 30 minutes for up to 90 seconds on Twitch. Um, and we like to pause the stream so that nobody misses anything, right? Um, so I usually encourage folks to go ahead and hydrate during this time. Um, if you don't have some water, run and get some. I put a timer on the screen so you know how long you've got. You've got about a minute left. Um, it gives me a chance to sort of regroup and think too and catch up on chat and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> Tamman, you like that segue, huh? <laughs> Every once in a while I can get them. Since we don't have a valid ID, we have ads. Yep. Yeah. Every every once in a while, I, the, the timing of it works out well. Where I can I can segue like that. One of these days, I'm actually gonna hook something up that'll like automatically trigger the ad screen because I still have to do it manually. I so, so I have to kind of like see that pop up out of the corner of my eye, which is why I miss it some, sometimes, but, and or why I'm a few, few seconds uh, late. Anyway, uh, we are done with ads. So for those of you that had ads up, um, we pause the stream whenever ads come up on the Twitch side, which is once every 30 minutes for up to 90 seconds, uh, just so that nobody misses any content. I put a timer on the screen to let you guys know exactly how long the ad break is. So that way, if you want to go get um, water or something like that to hydrate, you can. And you know exactly how long you have before we continue. All right. Um, working with it on in the background. Yeah, that works. I get it. I, I do the same thing um, quite often myself. Okay. So um, I think what was happening here is when we perform an allocation, uh, we auto zero out the memory, uh, which means that all of the new entries of this array when we reallocate are zero. And zero is a valid parent index because that is uh, something that exists. It's the first thing that exists uh, in the hierarchy graph, right? So I think what was happening was, is we weren't actually invalidating those entries. Uh, because we can actually search for an invalid ID, which is basically UN32 max. Um, and that is, uh, that should stop that from happening. So I, I think that might have been it. Um, did I build? I think I did, but double check. 35 plus viewers sec. Yeah, that is pretty, that is pretty cool. Appreciate you guys, by the way. All right, so um, we'll go ahead and run the debugger. I realize I just did that off screen. So here we go, let's load this up and see what we get. Uh, I'm going to disable this guy just for a second and let it rip. Disable this one too. All right, success, that's what it was. Okay, so um, fixed another bug that I didn't even know was there. Uh, now, interestingly, interestingly, our tree is gone. Um, so that's neat. Where did our tree go? Did we overwrite it somehow? Where did it wind up? Seems like we might have another issue with our with our hierarchy, right? Um, which is, you know, that's to be expected whenever you're putting these new systems in, right? Um, okay, so those things are not connected to each other in the hierarchy. Let's move the spawns out of the way, and I want to see if, maybe if, that tree is like really small at the origin, right? 
um, which would be right there. Is it? <laughs> Spiro, thank you for the follow over on YouTube. I appreciate that. Much appreciated, sir. All right. Um, hmm. So that's quite the conundrum. I wish I could select by ID. I need to actually implement that at some point. Um, okay. So let me think. What would cause... What would cause our tree to stop loading because we put another mesh in at the root level. Am I off with my logic when we do ensure allocate? So we do nodes allocated. Let me let me walk through this mentally for a second here. So the first time we call this we're going to essentially have nodes allocated of zero. Um, and in fact, I believe we even have this in here. Um, so if nodes allocated exists, then we use, or if it's not zero rather, if nodes allocated is not zero, then we double whatever nodes allocated is, otherwise it's one. Okay, so we start with one, um, and then we double that every time. So the first time we call this, nodes allocated will be one. So we start the parent index loop at one, the first time that this runs, which means index zero never actually gets invalidated. Is that an issue? I don't think it is. Because we also do a... We also push into that array when we're doing the search. So when we expand this a second time, when we go to add something in the second time, right, it's going to be two. So we do... We do a new allocation of the new node count the second time around. Then we do a copy from the current parent indices, size U32 times nodes allocated, which would be one the first time we reallocate. Right, so we, we move that first one. And then we start at index one, which would be the second entry. And we iterate that up to the new node count, which is what we allocated here. Well, technically new, no, new node count minus one. I don't think that's wrong. I don't think that's wrong at all. What could be, we're also not invalidating these handles. So that could be a thing too. Um, so K handle is invalid. We've got six uses of that. So when we're searching for empty entries, we are going by the... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I think this might actually be wrong. Does nodes allocated start at 
zero. Let me just make sure that it does. I think it, it should. It should be zero to ounce when we first create it. This is definitely, this definitely feels like an indexing issue for sure. You can't work um, when listening to another coding stream. You have to see what's going on. You can't concentrate your own coding. Yeah, I get that. Totally get that. Um, so was it? what was it now? Just scale it up to 100x. So I don't think it's actually showing at all. Um, I'm going to actually have to... You know what I'm going to do? Let's take a look at what tree is actually being generated. Right? So when we... Um, build the view tree. Let's see what the heck that is doing. All right, so we have nodes allocated as four. This is gonna be a problem right here, right off the bat. Because we're also not we're not invalidating those new handles. So that is going to be an issue. So just like we just like we had to do this, we also need to do the same thing for the node handles, right? So node handle index you know what let me rename that node handle index there we go um so this should be node handles and then k handle invalid Right, so we want to generate um, invalidate invalid handles. Um, so we should probably do it there, and levels I'm not too concerned about because that's really a debug thing. In fact, we're probably going to remove that at some point. Um, dirty flags. Dirty flags should be fine because that would default to false since it's zeroed out. So we don't need to do anything there. Um, X form handles though. Um, X form handle, oops, let's try that again. X form handle index. Right, we, we need to invalidate all those handles. I wonder if that's part of the problem too. You're a structural engineer right now. You're actually reviewing old project of yours that a client asked for modifications during construction. Yeah, that sounds, uh, I mean, structural engineering sounds fun, but it also sounds like what you're doing right now is probably pretty painful. If I had to guess, how right am I on that, Taman? All right, so let's kill that breakpoint and load. Yep, there it is. Yeah, so again, we weren't invalidating data um, on Realic. Okay, so um, what we should see now is uh, I should be able to select the Sponza, move that, the tree should go with it, right? Uh, we should also be able to uh, rotate this, right? The tree goes with it, right? And then this guy should be able to be operated on separately. Um, yep. Okay. Cool. So I think our I think our hierarchy is good to go, right? I can move the tree also uh, separately, so I can move um, I can move the tree further out from the sponza, and then rotate the sponza. 
maybe. If I can select the dang thing. That is way, way, way too fussy. I'm going to have to fix that. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So I think we've got that fixed. All right, cool. Um, so let's do scene loader and let's add another node. Um, Ryan, first time chat, welcome. Uh, first time watching live, normally watch the VODs while you work. Glad to finally catch a live one. Well, awesome, welcome to the stream. Glad to have you here. Um, Allerwig, all, all, Ollie Willig. I always pronounce that wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, good to see you. Uh, let's see. Tamman, it's not actually that bad, at least uh, because I still have computational models for the structure. Otherwise, you would have to model everything again. Oof, yeah, okay. So that's that's good anyway. Uh, Ryan, thank you for the follow-up. Appreciate that. Um, oh, you, you also messaged it over on the YouTube side. Okay. Yeah, I do try to keep an eye on both. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge sometimes, but I'm trying. <laughs> um, Patrick, hello. How's it going? Uh, just a quick question out of topic. How have you implemented the plane coordinate system grid? Is it a quad... And all in the fragment shader, is it texture mapped? Is it infinite Z zoom grid? Oh, you mean the, the grid? That's actually... You're talking about this guy, the grid? Yeah, if you're, if you're talking about that, that is literally just a series of lines. Um, the same way as I draw like bounding boxes and stuff, um, it's just, I just draw lines. So it's just geometry. And then it's, um, instead of filling in that geometry, I use uh, line mode to draw that. Same thing as I use for um, terrain when I actually um, go into wireframe mode. Yeah, that's all it is. Uh, speaking of terrain, um, well, should we do terrain next? I suppose we could do terrain next because um, that's kind of close to the way that... Um, it's kind of close to the way that uh, the meshes work. So if we take a look at our test scene, um, actually the next node that we have down here is terrain. So I think let's go ahead and get the terrain working. And then, cause that's almost gonna be carbon copy of this, I think. Um, and then we will move on to um, some of these other items up here, like our environment node with the skybox, uh, for example. Um, so let's go ahead and code this out and get that in there. Uh, AWR, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Um, you tried Vulcan once, you haven't looked back since. Yeah, I mean, I get that. Um, it's a lot, right? But once you get past that, that first sort of huge um, amount of code, uh, which really is just a couple of things, it's... Um, you have the initialization bit, right? And then you also have graphics pipelines, which take a lot. But once you get past all of that stuff and like actually loading shaders, like a lot of it becomes reusable. Um, and there's not actually that much Vulcan code anymore. Like I don't have to write that much Vulcan stuff anymore at this point. Um, at least until I get ready to do ray tracing. That's going to be different, but. Uh, Psycode, how's it going? <laughs> Live long and prosper. Yeah, because of the way he spelled uh, Vulcan. Yeah, I love it. It's all about familiarity. Well, it is, but also um, once you get to a certain point with your implementation, you don't have to write that much Vulcan code, right? Like most of it is front loaded. So once you get uh, the initialization and your graphics pipelines, your render passes, all that stuff set up um, and your descriptors, which is another big one. Once you have that stuff set up, it's just reuse at that point. And, and the stuff that you have to add beyond that is actually not that bad. Um, so the further you go with a Vulkan project, the less Vulkan code you have to write once you get the basics down. When you abstract the boilerplate away, then it's a breeze. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so it's just a matter of getting over that initial hurdle. But yeah. Uh, plus map generation, which is non-existent on Vulkan 
DirectX 12 unless you load from files. What do you mean that MitMap generation is non-existent? I'm generating them at the moment. Just using Vulkan images. So once what I do is I load the base texture and then use that image and just blit it onto other image layers for, for mit mapping. And we've already got that working in the engine, actually. Um, you can also do it in Compute Shader. Yeah, we don't have Compute support yet. Um, that is something we're going to have to add before too much longer. But but you need to do it manually. There's no, like, GL generate mit maps. True. Yep. Um, and that's true of... Uh, I think that's true in metal too, right? Any of the sort of explicit APIs, that's not going to do anything automatically for you. At all, really. You got to do it all yourself. All right, so let's load this terrain. All right, so I'm just going to do terrain. Uh, let's see, and I think there was one more. Okay, and then let's just do terrain. Ah, terrain attachment. Keep hitting the wrong dang keys. Uh, okay, so we've got terrain attachment there, there. Again, I hit the wrong key. All right, so we've got that. Um, the resource name in this case, I think was actually test underscore terrain. So that hasn't changed. Um, we'll do Terrain typed mesh attachment. Terrain typed mesh attachment. Um, and then terrain. Um, I do want to take a quick look at the scene. So we'll do um, scene and then uh, initialize in the node, uh, attachments, and then we'll do terrain. Uh, let's see, I think, I think this is, should already be mostly like correct and ready to go. I just want to make sure. So we are using, we are indexing correctly. Theory, we should be okay. Um, let's try it. This bit is unexercised code, so we'll see what happens. Let's run. And load. All right. So... Mesh job load. Oh, I think I know what I did. I forgot to change the attachment type. Yep. Copy pasta issue. Uh, Ten soon. First time chat. Welcome. How come you're not using C plus plus for this project? Uh, preference. So C compiles faster. It's a simpler language. Um, and I prefer it. Yeah, I like to code from scratch too. Yep. Um, I, I also don't use um, object-oriented programming, which is a big thing that C++ is about. I don't use most of the features that C++ offers, right? So I just don't see the point in using it. Um, the only things that, you know, there are a few features that I kind of wish that C had um, from C++, but it's not enough to make me actually switch over. Um. If I remember correctly, the Cherno actually has a video about mitmap generation. He probably does. Um, does he have it for Vulkan, do you know? 
So I don't remember. I did use STB. Yes. Um, yeah, I used STB to load fonts and images for now. Um, I actually am going to take those out of the main runtime and move those to an external tool set to convert things. Um, that way they're not actually part of the engine. Right now they're part of the engine and I sort of just do that on the fly, but um, eventually I'm going to get away from that. Function overload is really the only thing I miss when I use C over C++. Yeah, so um, operator overload for math functions might be nice for like vector types. Um, and then const expressions only for compile time generated string hashes. But other than that, not really. Um, let's see, another thing I sort of don't like about Vulkan is you need to use another external library for compiling shaders. GLSL, HLSL to spur V, which means you need to take care and sometimes bundle recompile. Another thing on the to-do list. Yeah, so we handled um, the compilation of shaders externally as part of like a post-build process for a while, but I got tired of doing that. Um, and so I, I wound up using shader C in order to um, in order to do it. So yeah, that is kind of a thing for sure. Um, not a deal breaker per se, just another thing you have to do. Um, you think both of those are, are god awful? Yeah, so here's the thing though. The only time that I think operator overloads are acceptable is for something like vector types, right? Um, where you have, uh, where you want to multiply two vectors or, or add two vectors together or multiply matrices, right? It is a little bit easier to say, just put an asterisk between them and have it work. Um, but that's pretty much it. Like C++'s overload of like this operator and this operator is hideous. Not a fan of that at all. Um, and I think it's, it's horribly abused. But yeah, um, as far as function overloads, function overloads, I don't really, I don't really use again because I don't really do oop a, but B also um, function overloads. I don't find to be all that useful, right? I actually like having my functions named separately. So I don't really use that all that well either. Um, they have a huge compile time impact. Yeah. Yep. And that's, again, one of the things I really like about C is it compiles much faster. Um, now, Microsoft's C compiler is not that quick, right? So compiling on here is a little bit slow. But when I switch over to Linux, it's like lightning fast. So for maths and C++, you just use GLM. Yeah, I mean, that's most people do, right? The only reason we wrote our own here is because it's an educational exercise, right? You mean the whole idea of adding another external lib, which you probably agree external libs can be a pain. Yep, exactly. Agreed. Fully agreed. Um, okay. Did I, I think I built, I lost track though. Singy, hello, how's it going? Welcome to the stream, good to see you. All right, um, let's run this, see where we get this time. Okay, so interestingly enough, I don't actually see where it's loaded that texture. Hmm. So the question is, is did it pick it up at all? Which I don't think it did. Let me go into uh, initialize and we'll do a breakpoint. See, that's directional light. Skybox, that's going to be the next thing we do. So, terrain, here we go. 
Um, okay, so let's put a breakpoint there. And load this up. Okay, so we, we, we did pick up the node correctly. Um, the type detachment is test terrain. Okay, so type detachment resource name doesn't exist. Interesting. Well, that would be why. Um, we also have ads. So for those of you who are new to the stream, um, we get ads served uh, once every um, 30 minutes on Twitch for up to 90 seconds. So I just like to pause the stream so that nobody misses uh, concert uh, content. Um, and so those of you on YouTube, I know the ad situation is a little bit different over there, but that's why we pause the stream. I also put a timer up on the screen so that you guys know exactly how long it's going to be before uh, we come back. So if you need to kind of get up and run to grab some water or something, you've got time to do that. Uh, let's see. I see the error in the code, by the way. Almost done with ads. All right. Ads are dead. So, who sees the issue in the code? <laughs> I do. There's no negation there. <laughs> so I'm saying if the, if the resource name exists, then bleat about it, right? Oops. All right, uh, so. Um, so we have right here, we need to do a knot. Let's see. Um, In GL, you don't have to add an external lib to do the compilation, but it's up to the driver to compile it for you, which is can be an issue. Uh, good luck debugging uh, some shader errors caused by different drivers compiling different. Yep, exactly. Um, which I do agree with, right? Uh, also, with the external libs, it's sometimes hard to shave off the stuff you don't really need and or integrate it the way that you would like to because of the API slash way of working with the lib is this or that. Yeah, 100% agreed. Um, there's always a trade-off, exactly. Yep. The whole point in intermediate formats like Spur V and DXIL is standardization. Um, yeah, so isn't it great that WebGL is not using Spur V? Or uh, not WebGL, WebGPU. Fantastic decision by them, right? Um, yeah, it, t it totally depends on the library. Yep. The issue sits 40 centimeters in front of the screen. Yeah, exactly. Syntax error 40. Yep. We need more attachments on these attachments. Got to bump those numbers up. Yeah, I know, right? Um, Mikhail, you need to leave. Thanks for, um, thanks for being here. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. The intermediate formats are nice, but has other problems. Like now we have to, now we have more sh shader languages like WGSL. Yeah, that was what I was just talking about. And the new one from NVIDIA with the same name, with with the name I forgot, which I can't think of what that is either. Um, the native implementation of WebGPU allows Spur V? I thought they were dumping that for... 
W, uh, WGSL. Weren't they? I can't remember. I, I vaguely remember reading that somewhere. I think it was for um, WebKit. It has both. It has both now, but I think they're going to be dropping Spurvy. It supports it now, but I don't think it's going to support it in the future. All right. Uh, so now that we've rebuilt that, let's run. I'm going to kill this breakpoint just to see what happens. Okay. Mm Let's see, what did we get? We're trying to duplicate a, a null pointer. That's not gonna work. Okay. Um, so config name. Probably cause then, yeah, okay. So let me think about this for a second. I guess I guess we could add a name to like the attachment configuration, right? I guess that's fine. Just to sort of get around this issue. Um, I know most of them don't have attachment. Uh, most attachments don't have names yet. And I've kind of been okay with that, but I think we should support it even if it's not necessarily used. Um, right, so we'll just do that. Um, over in the... Let's see, over in the scene loader, um, in the mesh attachment definition, we will also do character array name. And then we'll do um, terrain typed mesh attachment name equals test terrain. Doesn't really matter what the name is, I'm just plugging something in for now. There's a presentation on the official Vulkan YouTube channel called Vulkanize 2024 towards the next gen Vulkan shading language. Our journey with slang. Interesting. Haven't seen that one. Source 2 already works with that. See, like, I don't know. Like, Spur V was supposed to be like the the go-to format, right? And now they're coming out with another format. And it's like, come on, guys, just pick one. Yeah, more shading languages, exactly. Like, I think what I'm probably going to wind up doing in this engine, just to get away from that crap, is I'm probably going to wind up writing my own shading language and just translating to whatever the back end needs from that, which is a huge pain in the ass. I'm not happy about it, but I think that's going to be the best way to go. Because then you don't have to have um, different types of or different sets of shaders for each individual language. Slang has interfaces and generics. Why? <laughs> but why? Like, why do you need that? that? Like, a shader should be super, super, super simple. Someone should make a standard that unifies all the standards. Yeah, we need templates. Oh, God. You guys are trying to give me a migraine. <laughs> HLSL has templates as well. Um, I vaguely remember reading that a while ago, but I haven't looked at it in ages, so I couldn't tell you how they work. Okay, what? What do you mean you don't have a name still? Did I... Oops, I didn't mean to stop that. I meant to. Scene node initialize. Oh, because I didn't copy it over here. Okay. 225. Um, scene. We need to copy it over here. So new terrain config name equals typed attachment name. Oh, 
Okay. Let's run this. Uh, what? Outside of allocator range. What breakpoint are you even paused on? So... It doesn't like, oh, I see why. Because these are constant strings, that's why. Okay. Can't do that. Um, because these strings, uh, and this technically won't happen when we're reading this from a file, these will be dynamic strings, but because the, the original source of the strings was um, constant, uh, we're gonna have to do a string duplicate which we probably should be doing anyways um, just because we don't want to have to be concerned about um, those strings dying off before we're ready to, to stop using them right so um, that also means I need to do the same thing here for name and name right Slightly annoying, yes, but we're loading stuff and it's just like, it's not that big of a deal. Um, we might actually disable names on release builds. Okay. All right. So there's our terrain block. Uh, it's transform is wrong. I think. Yes, its transform is wrong. Why is its transform wrong? Oh, wait a minute. Um, I know why. Because I think I copy pasted it and didn't change it in the loader. Yeah, that would do it right here. Um, so, uh, what we actually need is I'm going to mimic these values here. So, uh, we need negative 50, I could just be 0.5, whatever. Um, oh wait, no, that's negative, not negative 0 0.50, negative 50. Um, oops, that's scale. Wow. Helps to read. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna use Vector 3, 1 there. Vector 3, create here. So we'll do 50 for x. Uh, y is negative 3.9. Um, and I think I did this because the initial um, way that I'd sort of set up the scene didn't sort of, um, things didn't line up nicely. So I had to kind of move them around a little bit. All right, so we've got a a one scale here, which is fine, I can just use that. We have an identity rotation, identity quaternion. So really it was just the um, it was just the position that was wrong, right? So let's rebuild that. Rune, thank you for the follow, appreciate that. Welcome to the stream. All right, uh, so we will launch this. Mm. Did I put positive 50 instead of negative 50? Oh, yes, I did. Right there. See, this is where being able to save the scene file is going to come in handy. Right. Um... And I'm hoping we can actually get to that tonight. There we go. 
Okay, cool. So now we have our um, our terrain loaded in. We have meshes loaded in. We know our parenting works. So the next thing I'm going to put in is the skybox so we can get rid of this ugly default uh, cube map that's causing all this redness. Um, so let's do that. Um, so our cube map really should only require these things, right? We have, um, or our skybox rather. So we have uh, the type of skybox and then we have a cube map name. So it's gonna look um, a lot like this minus the transform information. Um, which speaking of which this should say terrain. So I'm actually going to take this and um, let's see. So we're actually gonna have two attachments on this new environment node, right? So we're gonna have this environment node is gonna be this guy and it's got two attachments. It has the skybox, which we'll do first and then we'll do the directional light second, um, which this I think is gonna require a little bit more work, but. Uh, Lavi, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that, welcome. <laughs> Travis the human parser, exactly, yeah. Feels like it sometimes, for sure. Hamster Dev, how's it going? Name, not resource name. Yeah, so um, we needed both for, for terrains, um, which is a requirement I probably will eliminate. Like if we provide a name, cool. If we don't, then who cares? Um, but rather than trying to figure that out on the fly, I just so I just uh, provided it. Uh, Yasin, um, first time chat, hello. How's it going? Welcome to the stream. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Whatever my name is over on YouTube. Thank you for the uh, the sub there. Um, Tamaz, actually GCC Clang support operator overloading for seam deep vectors. Yeah, if you use the extension, yeah. Um, I don't think I want to do that though. I try to stay away from extensions as much as possible. Um, for what I think is semi-obvious reasons, right? Because that takes away from portability. Oh, I mistyped it. Added it to the attachment, but you copy the resource name twice. Oh, you mean, you mean this? Or over on the, oh, you mean over on the, um, the actual. Yep, you're right, right there. Uh, typed attachment name. Why is that? Am I missing something here? That should have, I could have swore I added that. Oh, I put it on the static mesh. What a dingus. There we go. Typed attachment. Name is there. Why is it saying no number, no member name to that? What? New terrain config. Typed attachment is this guy. I'm looking at it, it's right there. Okay, let me try building this real quick. Scene node attachment static mesh. Oh, 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 I know what happened, okay. It's bleating about it here. This should be, 
should be that. That's why I added it to the wrong type because I didn't change that. Okay. All right, um, so I'm gonna take all of this. And put it down here. We're gonna get rid of the X form stuff. We don't need that. Um, we're gonna do environment. All right. Um, we're gonna call this environment. Um, see node attachment config. So I'm gonna call this skybox attachment. All right. Um, we're gonna do attachment type skybox. Um, Ooh, I didn't change this type up here either. That should be terrain. This should be skybox. Uh, this should also be skybox. Uh, let's do skybox typed mesh attachment. Skybox typed mesh attachment. Um, let's see. So I think this one just has cube map name and that's it. So cube map name and then we're going to do just skybox for that. We don't have a name for it. Um, and then we're gonna do environment Attachments, attach, skybox, attachment. And then we're gonna push environment. Okay. So that's that. Now in the scene, we have to take a look at the skybox code, which I think I have mostly worked out. Um, just want to really quickly look over it and see if there's anything that's like super obviously missing. I don't think so. Okay, so let's give that a whirl. Dingus, I didn't mean to open a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know how it is sometimes. Sometimes you're just uh, you're just a dingus when you're developing stuff, right? Just copy pasta issues and whatnot. All right, I'm not surprised that we have some sort of issue here. Uh, so typed attachment. Cube map name is null. Sweet. Uh, okay, so why? Why is cube map name why is that not populated? Um so environment. We have the skybox type. Attachment data. We allocate the right amount of memory. Here's the typed attachment. Environment attachments. We push skybox attachment. Okay. Uh, the cube map name is right there. Oh. Womp womp, the dingusness strikes again. 
That's what I get for uh, copy pasta. I should just be writing these things like manually instead of copying it, I suppose. Uh, let's also do that. Okay, I think I got rid of all of them. Copy pasta. Terrain attachment. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Sometimes when you're doing it and trying to like explain it at the same time, you don't see it, even though it's right in front of you, which sounds ridiculous, but it's truly what happens. All right, so load. Hey, we now have a skybox. Now, I don't know what this is on about, so that's kind of interesting. Um, we'll have to debug that. I have a feeling it might be because I have nothing selected. Or it's how the skybox is being loaded. I'm not 100% sure, so we'll have to figure that out. Uh, Xform local get. Turning identity matrix. Okay. So we can tell our irradiance is being used correctly, though. It's getting that from the skybox, which is good. Um, so I think the skybox is actually working correctly. I think what's happening is it's trying to, it's expecting a transform from somewhere and it's not getting it. Um, probably because the skybox doesn't have a transform. So um, let's do, let's do a search for this guy. And stick a breakpoint here and see. So we're doing the hierarchy graph update. Ah, okay. So uh, this is something I hadn't fully count, counted on um, or thought about at least. So remember, we split up our transforms and our hierarchy into two separate systems, right? Because we don't necessarily want all of our nodes in our hierarchy to have a transform because they don't always necessarily need them. Um, but it looks like in our hierarchy graph, we are doing that calculation regardless of whether or not there's actually something there to calculate. Um, so that actually brings up uh, a discussion point because there's a couple ways that we could go off and handle this. Um, the C peoples, thank you for the follow, I appreciate that. So, um, I guess I will bust out paint real quick. Actually, I think I have an instance open here. The one from Spiro's stream yesterday. Um, so I'll just back all of that out. All right, so the idea is uh, we have um, a hierarchy with a bunch of nodes in it, right? Um, and so I'm just going to draw like a, a very quick and dirty representation of this, right? So, um, we have a hierarchy that looks like some, something like this of nodes. Okay. And we'll say this root node has a transform. This guy has a transform. This guy has a transform, and this guy has a transform, right? But maybe this one doesn't have a transform because it's like a folder, for example, right? Um, and so uh, the whole idea here is, is, you know, if this is just being used as a folder to like um, represent like a group of meshes or um, maybe like a group of environment attachments or something like that, right? Um, the idea is that we don't necessarily need a, um, a transform at this level. And so one of the things that we could do is we could, we could say, we could put in a rule to say, Hey, uh, if, if this, if this particular, um, node does not have a transform, then it's children shouldn't be allowed to either. Right. We could put that rule in place or. We could say, um, when we when we look up this guy, if he doesn't have a transform, 
look at his parent if there is one. And if it has a transform, use that. Um, and I think that's probably the way that we're going to go with it. Or at least that's what I'm going to try to do and see how it works. Um, and go from there. But before we try that, we have to try ads because we have them on the screen and the Bezos requires that we run ads. So with that, um, we do a pause for 90 seconds while uh, the ads are running over on the Twitch side. I know YouTube side works a little bit differently, uh, but we, we break the stream so that nobody misses anything um, and folks can hydrate. So I highly suggest that you guys do that. Um, yeah, I will catch up with the, uh, with the Twitch chat as soon as, uh, ads are done. Cause I see you guys were talking about the exact thing that we ran into, right? <clears throat> so we got about, uh, 30 seconds left on ads. and ads are dead. So uh, let me catch up on the chat over on the Twitch side. Uh, maybe it's trying to get an X form for the skybox. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was trying to do. You called it. Yep. Um, <laughs> loading time. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Pretty sure that's how Unreal handles it. Uh, transform components can't be children of non-transform components. So while that makes sense to me, it kind of seems a little bit restrictive, right? And it's kind of seems like something that we would have to account for in a bunch of different places, um, particularly the editor. Um, we'd also have to account for it when we're loading up the scene. Um, we'd have to account for it when we're trying to move one node um, to be a, a child of another node, like in the, the UI when we have that. Um, and it just seems like something that kind of seems a little bit restrictive and isn't fully necessary, right? Um, and so on the surface, I think I want to try this this method first where we just kind of go up the tree and as long as we have um, as long as we have a parent node, we just keep searching up that tree for the parent node um, or for the next node up um, that actually has a transform and use that. If we run into a situation where Maybe we have um, maybe we have another root, right? Because we can have more than one root. Um, so maybe we have another root with a situation where maybe the root itself does not have a transform, but uh, this node down here does, right? Uh, and these are connected like that. Um, then in that case, we would just say there is no world transform. Uh, just use the local transform as the world transform. Trade-off, uh, let's see. Um, what's your use case for groups without transforms? Um, so to act as a folder, essentially, right? So uh, a lot of editors, um, or a, lo a lot of times in, in levels, you might have um, a bunch of things that are under, a, like, uh, I guess if you want to call it a game object in Unity, right? Um, and the only purpose of that is to group objects, right? It has, it serves no other purpose. Like you don't need, um, like in this case, uh, in our, in our environment, right? This is kind of acting as a folder, right? Because the skybox doesn't have a transform and the directional light doesn't have a transform. They don't need it, right? So there's no, there's no need to grab this environment node and move it and have everything else under it move as a group, right? There is no moving this. It's not something you can select um, in the world per se, uh, it's just something that kind of is there and can be 
edited via you know properties of of the um, of the object within the tree, right? So there's no need for any of this to have any transform. Is is sort of the use case there? Trade off that you could imagine is probably bypasses having to deal with uh, the component search up the tree. That is true, right? Um, and so we can. I think we can always. Because what we're doing right now is we're actually rebuilding the tree on every frame, which is not necessary. It's completely unnecessary, right? Um, but we're doing that just so that we're always sure that we're up to date while we're testing the system. Eventually, the way that that's going to work is we're only going to rebuild that tree when the hierarchy changes. Um, and so at that point, that would really be the only time that you ever need to search for that data. Because once you have that tree built that contains all of that hierarchy of the nodes and all that stuff, excuse me, um, there is no searching, right? It, it's then a direct handle to a X form, right? Um, and so at that level, there is no searching like every frame, right? We're only doing it every frame because we're rebuilding the tree every frame. But once you have the tree built, like there is no lookup at that point. It's just a handle straight to the X form. So I don't think that's going to be too much of an issue. Um, the Fluff9, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Welcome. All right, um, so what we need to do in the hierarchy graph, when we are, when we are Reconstructing the, actually, is it the, is it this? Yeah, I think this is where we are running into it, right? Um, yeah when we're updating the tree view node, right? So this only happens when we're building the tree. Um, what was that, line 72? So we have this check of dirty, which is also another optimization we need to put in place, right? We're just kind of brute forcing this thing for now. So the first thing that we need to do is check to see, do we even have a local matrix, right? Because if we don't, we can just short circuit the whole thing. So um, the first thing is uh, if um, do we want to do a negative? No, we'll, we'll do a K handle is invalid. Uh, and we'll do a um, node x form handle right so if that is invalid we're just going to return right we're not even going to bother searching up the tree for um something that doesn't have a transform in the first place this is probably going to solve our skybox problem right because it doesn't have a transform so it shouldn't be searching up the tree anyway um if it does then that's when we're going to have to search up the tree um so the first thing we'll want to do there is um, uh, Ali Mickey, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Uh, the first thing we're going to want to do there is calculate the local, right? We know we have a local at that point. Um, obviously, we'll need to check the dirty flag. Um, and then the world matrix. We'll say if, let's see, parent world. So the... Hmm. So the view node is passed in that way as a pointer to this function. And I don't think that we can do Okay. I don't know why my LSP has just completely like pooped itself, but I'm just going to relaunch Vim real quick. All 
All right. Um, so node, we only have children in this case. I'm wondering if we should have, because essentially this is like a, hmm. Should we have a link back up to the parent so that we can just go up the tree? I'm kind of thinking that maybe we should. Um, let me think about this for a second. So the parent world matrix is passed in. Maybe we should be passing Well, technically speaking, if we pass in, or if we allow the, if we store a pointer to the parent node, we wouldn't have to pass in the parent node to this or pass this, which is probably going to be a better way to do it. Um, update tree view node. Uh, so that's the recursive aspect of it there. Uh, we're doing this. Node X form handle. So we update the world matrix or the, uh, yeah. Okay. So I suppose we could pass through. We could pass through the handle or we could pass through a pointer to it. thinking I'm thinking we ought to have a hand like a pointer to the node so if we do we have children here right let's also do a struct view node parent and it's going to be a pointer to the parent Right, um, and so when we do build view tree, for example, when we set up the root, we're also going to say root parent equals zero at this level, and then when we build the children when we build the children uh, we have we already have a pointer to the parent you know what let me actually let me just go to this definition All right so we do this so when we create this we'll do child parent equals parent. That way we have that. Um, okay, so at that point, we can then come back into this when we're doing the update of the view node. And instead of Instead of looking at that, we can say if node parent. Um, just trying to think. So if we update the on the parent node, if we set that transform the world for that, then we should be able to get, actually, we need to, we need to modify this. Um, let's get rid of parent world, right? We shouldn't be passing that there. Um, let's get rid of 
parent world from here. And remove that, right? Because we're actually storing that off. We don't need to pass it around. Um, which I think that's actually going to cause an issue down here as well. Okay. Okay, so now we can say um, if node parent exists, then the parent world matrix is equal to um, x form get world or world get rather, uh, and that's going to be node parents x form handle. Let me just do that. Um, now we need, we're also going to have to recursively go up the list, right? So we're going to have to do a little bit more logic here, right? So this gives us what we, what we already had but using the parent pointer instead. Um, so to get this to work and like recurse up the tree, um, we're going to have to do a, oh, uh, let's see, node parent. All right, let's do this. We'll say um, k handle. parent x form handle um, equals node parent x form handle. And then we'll do while um, k handle is invalid parent x form handle. Um, then we'll do we're actually going to have to track the parent as well. Uh, so we'll do a hierarchy graph node parent equals node parent. Um, so we'll say parent equals uh, node parent parent. Um, and then if parent again. Um, then we'll say parent x form handle equals parent x form handle. And then that will loop around, check this again. Um, if parent is not there, then parent x form handle equals k handle invalid, right? We're just going to generate a invalid handle and we're just going to break, right? So at this point, um, we can then look and say, well, okay, if um, k handle is invalid, um, parent x form handle, then um, there is no uh, parent with a transform anywhere up the tree, um, just use local, right? So we'll basically just do the same thing that's down here. So we'll just say world equals node local, right? Otherwise, we will do this, um, except for instead of using um, Instead of using node parent x form handle, we'll use parent x form handle. Um, and that should give us what we need, I think. So that should recurse all the way up the tree. 
If there is no parent, that means we're at the root. And if we haven't found a valid handle by then, then that means there's not one to use, so just use the local. Otherwise, we would have found one that is a valid handle, and we can get that instead. So I think, I think that's going to give us what we need. Uh, let's see. Let me catch up on chat. Would you choose any other language if you were starting this engine today, like Zig, for example? So Zig is interesting to me. Um, whoops, I forgot to actually, I forgot to kill the application. Hang on a second. Um, let me just get this to build real quick and I will, um, okay. So Zig is interesting to me. Um, the only reason that I haven't taken a serious look at it is because it's such a young language and it still has issues, right? It's still not stable. There's not a stable release of it yet. Um, so when that happens, I will take a look at it um, because I do I do think that that's an interesting alternative, right? Um, there are a lot of things that I, I like, at least on the surface about it. Um, and at that point, I'll try it. Um, Odin, I don't know too much about. I haven't looked in that direction, to be completely honest. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I still prefer C because, you know, like Hamster says there, it is the easiest to reason about in terms of um, what's going on, right? At least for me. And and that may be because I'm a grizzled ancient and skill issue or whatever, you know, whatever it is. But... Um, if I were to if I were to switch, and Zig were stable, I might look in that direction, maybe. Okay, um, so we built successfully. So let's run and find out what we got. Okay, so uh, looks like. Looks like we didn't get something quite right in here. Um, okay, so. So we do have a parent here. Parent X form handle. Whoa, that's a wild handle index, okay. Uh, how did we get that? Parent X form handle. Gonna have to debug that guy. All right, so I've restarted. I'm gonna reload now. Um, so we do have a parent here. Uh, so this is probably Let's see what we got past as the parent, right? Um, so we did the build build view tree. I probably need to look at that first, actually. Let's make sure that we're getting something past that is sane. All right, so we're going to build the view tree. All right, uh, so we start off with no parent. Um, so we create a child array for uh, the first node because it has a child. Uh, the parent here. is the first node in the hierarchy. So that's going to be the Sponzo, right? So the parent is the Sponzo object, which means we're in the tree object now. And so we're saying, uh, as we're creating that, that, that tree child, we're saying its parent is going to be the Sponzo, right? So that makes sense. 
Um, and then we say, let's build out the children of the tree node, um, which we know that there are none, right? So um, let's see. So we're just going to loop through um, all of these. None of them match up. None of them have a parent index that matches up, right? So we... Um, How many nodes allocated do we have? Why do we have eight nodes allocated? Oh, because we, what do we have? What do we have, five now? I think that makes sense. Uh, let me see. Um, what was that? Um, scene loader. So we have the environment node, terrain node, falcon node, tree and spot. Yeah, we have five. Okay, so that's why we have eight allocated. That makes sense. All right, so we have to loop through all of those. Um, oh shoot, I think I just stepped over the one that I wanted to actually debug. I gotta start over. I think I just stepped over the one that I actually wanted to step into, unfortunately. Um, so we probably ought to do, I think a break point here. When we push the child onto the children array, because uh, we're actually only gonna do that once in the entire grand scheme of things. So we'll load, we build the view tree. Okay, um, and so the child here is the tree its parent is the sponsor, which does not have a parent, but does have an X form handle. And the handle index on that is valid in both cases. Okay, so this makes sense. All right. Um, so this is going to take off on the next node, which is not going to have any children. Okay. So now we're back to the roots, which is going to have this pushed onto it, right? So this is the first, the first root. Uh, so it does have a child, has no parent, right? Um, the child is the tree, it has no children, right? So we just have those two there. So we push that onto the roots array, and then we move on to the next one. So uh, we're gonna skip index one here because it's parent indices, means that it's not a root node. So the next one is going to be, what, our, ter uh, our falcon. So again, we have um, no parent on that, it's a root node. We say, okay, we build out the children. Does it have any children? Um, right? So we have that. We have valid handles. So we push that onto the roots array. Okay. Um, the next one is going to be the terrain. It also doesn't have any children, but it does have uh, node and transform handles and those are valid. Okay, so the next one's gonna be the skybox, or I should say not the skybox, but it's going to have, um, it's the environment node, right? That has the skybox attachment. So it also has no children. And no parent, right? Um, okay, so this, it does not have an X form handle, right? It does not have a transform. So it's, it's X form handle is invalid ID. That's what this number here is. Um, so we go ahead and push that. 
Oops, I hit the wrong button there. All right, and then we should just skip over the rest of the nodes, but not skip over ads. So for those of you who are new to the stream, uh, we do have, um, we do break for ads once every 30 minutes for 90 seconds or up to 90 seconds so that nobody misses any content. Uh, over on the YouTube side, I know it's a little bit different for you guys there, but yeah. Um, yeah, we, we just don't want anybody to miss any content. So, um, and Famia, I know you're, um, you're over on the YouTube side to avoid the ads, but, um, we still break for them anyways, just because, um, we don't want folks to miss, to miss content. Right. Um, but I usually say to use this as, uh, an excuse to get up and get some water, right? So that you're, you're hydrated. Uh, let's see. Oh, I have some Twitch chat to catch up on, looks like. We're almost done with ads anyway. Got about 15 seconds left. All right. Ads are done. Uh, let's see. So, I'm a beginner and I really love the idea of making a game engine. Um, I wrote Snake, uh, Bong, Int, C++, very simple games. I don't know what book should I read or uh, where to start. So, uh, yeah, as Tamman said, Game en Engine Architecture by uh, Jason Gregory. Um, I recommend that book all the time. I don't actually have it here because I'm rereading it again. Um just because it's got that much information in it that you can't possibly get everything out of it in, in one sitting, right? Um, so definitely get that book. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Um, Kohi and Hazel are also great learning resources. True. Two very different approaches to engine programming. Also true. Um, which is simpler? Probably Hazel. Um, only because he uses libraries. But there's lots of black boxes there as a result, right? So we tend to do deep dives and explore things here. Um, which means that it takes longer to, to, to make progress, but it also means that um, we fully explore these concepts as, as we're going into them, right? Um, but yes, I would say Kohi is probably more complete, or at least it will be by the time we get, um, you know, somewhat feature parity with some of the other engines, right? Um, Yen explains it very well. Yes, he does. Yeah, he does. Um, you own game engine architecture. You didn't find it to be an incredibly useful resource. Um, it, it is, it is kind of high level, right? Um, looking through publicly available commercial engines and diving straight into it, I think is the great way to learn. That is also a great way to learn, right? But it's also like you look at, um, engines like Unreal that use heavy OOP, right? And it's not necessarily always the best or or fastest way to go, right? Um, it tends to be a little bit overcomplicated for somebody that is trying to learn how to do this stuff to begin with, right? So um, I learned by um, a combination of doing lots of reading of, of different engines, Unreal included. Um, and also uh, I used to work uh, on the Torque game engine back in the day um, quite, a, quite a lot. I worked with that quite a lot too. So yeah. Um, and just always look at, at examples of how other people accomplish stuff, right? Uh, Handmade Hero is another good one. Yep, for sure. Um, you just don't dig Unreal's code. Yeah, it's uh, it's very complex. Um, been a while since you've read Game Engine Architecture. For, uh, if you recall correctly, it glossed over a lot. So it does, right? Um, it doesn't, it's not a deep dive, right? It kind of loosely describes the way that the um, various systems work and how they interact with one another. Um, and it does go into some things like memory management and um, best practices for C++ and stuff like that, SIMD, things like that. Um, 
but you know if it if it did a deep dive like what we're doing here that book would be you know volumes that are like this thick you know like you couldn't ever do it um but yeah you fear no men but that thing scares me <laughs> which thing um diamon how's it going good to see you had a question uh you've been building the math library using simd wondering if you thought it's worth using uh, M128 for VEC3 with one w wasted float, it's slightly faster in one in, in some algorithms. Yes, I would say so for sure. Um, in fact, when we do when we go to do SIMD here, I'm going to do that. Um, DZ House, uh, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Uh, you also noticed that with. Uh, O0 optimization, SIMD is often slower than non-SIMD, and with O3 is faster. Um, would you test SIMD on O3? Probably. I mean, O3 is what, what I'm eventually going to target for release builds, right? So, um, Unreal is complicated, but it is all there. Uh, you could de debug step all the way down the rabbit hole, and that's exactly what I did. I spent days slash weeks looking through that code to understand it do that and then implementing it in your own code and seeing it break spectacularly were huge learning experience exactly exactly yeah um and so you follow that example and then you go what would i do differently and that's where you really start learning was when you start writing that stuff on your own and going well i'm gonna do it this way instead and try the thing and see if it works the compiler just keeps swapping registers on o0 and i was confused when reading the disassembly. Yeah. Because um, it kind of tries to put that stuff in there for you automatically, even without SIMD. Doesn't do a very good job at it, but um, yeah, the SIMD can actually wind up being slower <laughs> in some cases, um, especially like on debug builds. I don't fear C++, but um, people who suggest using virtual functions and large entity systems are scary. Yeah. I've been down that road. I've, I've written those systems before and uh, I've written them enough to know that I never want to do it again. Basically. Is there a way to do a layer from DirectX 11 or 12? Do you mean like a, a renderer layer? Like a renderer backend? Because yeah, we could definitely do that in here. In fact, I intend to in the future if that's what you mean. Um... It's also hard not to recommend diving into that. Um, when I came by, the only real option is being available uh, to look at was the source engine for a while. Yep. Or more bare bones engines like Torque or Leadwork. Yeah, also, um, oh, I just had one in mind and now I can't think of what it was. Um, there was another one that I looked through quite a lot too. And now I can't think of it. If it comes to me, I'll, I'll I'll mention it. But yeah, there was there was another one I I looked out. Um, what are the benefits? What benefits are there choosing C over C plus plus and developing a game engine? Um, language simplicity, compilation speed. Um, I don't use OOP, um, which is a big thing in C plus um, plus. I don't use most of the features of C plus plus actually. So yeah, um, it's mostly preference, but uh, there are some other considerations as well. CryEngine and QuakeForge. Yeah, there, there's those, but there, yeah, there was another one I I can't think of. I had it right on the tip of my head, too, and now I can't think of it. But anyway. Um, okay. So the root count is four. Yes, we have four roots. That makes sense. So now we need to update the tree view node for each of those. So the first node is our Sponza node. It does not have a parent. So we use the local. Um, we use the local as the world, right? And then set the world on that. Um, and then we go into the children, which there should be one. Yep. 
So we update that. Uh, that one does have a parent, right? So uh, we start off saying that we want the parent. Now this, hmm. So that's where it fell apart, right there. So let's see, we have node children. So why is this foobar? Hmm. Because we're passing through. So something about this, somewhere along the way, these handles got screwed up. And even this is wrong. So the node itself and the parents nodes are wrong. So it's gotta be something in the build tree. Let's restart. So we're looking through our allocated nodes. We have the first one. The parent indices sub zero is invalid ID. Okay, so that means it's a root node. So we go ahead and we stand up this view node structure, right? So the root here has parent and children, which are for now null. The node handle and the xform handle have valid indices and valid unique IDs. Okay, so we step into this guy to build the child of that. We skip the first node. The second node is the child that we're looking for, right? Um, so in this case, uh, the parent does not have a children array. So we create that, right? Um, wait a minute, parent. Yes, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so we, we create this, right, because we're we're instantiating the, the child node, but we have to say, uh, can the parent have anything added to its array? Does its array exist? It didn't, so we created it. So that now, why is this giving me? Are you guys seeing this? Oh, because it's it's grabbing the first uh, array entry off the children, which doesn't exist. Okay, that actually does make sense. Never mind. Um, okay. So we set up the child to have its own X form handle. It has a pointer to its parent, whose handles are valid. Um, it does not have a parent. It does have children though. And if we expand that, we should have the same address. We should be able to just go back and forth with this, right? Um, oh wait, no, we're not gonna be able to do that because we haven't pushed it to this array yet. So that actually does kind of make sense. Uh, hmm. That makes me wonder if we should actually do the array push first. Maybe that's the problem. 
So if we step into the child to build out its children, we're not going to find anything, essentially. We're going to skip all eight of these entries. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Done with the loop, return. So now we're going to push this child into the parent's array. Right? So then if we do parent children, which gives us the first child node, we then have a pointer back to the parent, which should give us a pointer back to the children, which should allow us to basically just infinitely do this, right? And the addresses match. Okay, so that is correct so far. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna find the next We're going to try and find another child of that node. Um, and so we're on index three now. Four, five, six, seven. Okay, we're not going to find anything else. So now we're back at the root level. Because uh, this root did not have any more children, right? So now if we take a look at roots, it the root um, the first root node does not have any parents does have children that first child node which would be the the tree right so this top one's the spawns of this bottom one's the tree does have a pointer back to the parent does not have any children so if we expand the parent that puts us back at the root node which then we have children parent, children, parent, children, right? We can ex expand that all the way down, just keep recursing. So that is correct. And then the next thing that we're gonna build is all of the rest of the roots. So, so this one is the next root that we're going to be building out. So we have, I know that that's not going to have any children, so we can just skip over that, right? If we take a look at this root, it has no parent, it has no children. Um, we'll push to the roots array, and then actually let me move this over to our debugger. Right, um, and I'm just going to do eight of these guys. So we can just kind of watch exactly what happens here. So, so far we have two roots pushed in there, right? So now we'll go another round. And I see that this memory just got changed from that somehow. So we'll set up a new root. It didn't have any children. We'll push that. That caused a reallocation of the roots array. Oh. Ooh. That's what's going on. This memory address changed, which invalidates all the other pointers to the other nodes we created. Yep. <laughs> which is the reason I'm switching away from using pointers in the first place. Okay. Um, hmm. Back to the drawing board in terms of how we're going to recurse this. Uh, let's see. Well, 
Let's see. Um, so oop equals bad. Not always, right? So um, oop doesn't make sense in a lot of cases, right? I think it's widely overused and abused, right? Um, I will not say that it is always bad, though. There are plenty of places where it makes sense to use, usually in business software, right? Um, usually when you're working on enterprise architecture, right? Um, then it's fine. But for something like game engines, it tends to cause a lot of memory fragmentation, which is really terrible, especially if you're ever going to uh, target consoles. Um, a lot of consoles uh, are super, super susceptible to memory fragmentation in terms of performance. Um, it doesn't really affect desktop PCs that badly, but um, consoles are a whole other ball game. Um, and so I don't know what consoles uh, all we're going to support here, but I'm trying to develop that with that in mind to kind of keep data local, right? And, and try to avoid memory fragmentation um, as much as possible because it is a big issue on a lot of consoles, right? So um, OOP tends to cause a lot of that, which is why it tends to be avoided in game dev spaces. Um, so there are uh, scenarios where that doesn't matter. Um, there are scenarios where it does matter, right? So it's it's all comes down to writing or using the right tool for the right job, right? Um, id tech, yes, the id tech engines. That's what I was trying to think of. Yes, the id tech engines are fantastic to look at. Yes, that's actually where I got the renderer front end, renderer back end concept from. Um. Everyone's opinion, opinionated about what they like and dislike. You find OOP very intuitive when it comes to game engines in particular. I would say the opposite for game engines. Um, maybe for higher level code, but lower level code, absolutely not. Um, I, tend to it, it, I tend to find it gets in the way. Um, that's just from my experience. Um, but for something like UIs, it could make sense, right? So it really depends on what you're doing. Um, Paul and Hobbs, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Welcome. Yeah, don't get caught up in it. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, um, you know, it's it's all about using the right tool for the right job. Um, nothing is bad all the time, right? Like we use go to statements in here. People will tell you backwards and forwards that go to is evil. Never use it. We use it here, right? There, it's a tool that's that is there and exists for a reason, right? Um. I would start writing my own language before starting with an engine. <laughs> I mean, you could. Um, right now, when Kohi launches, the console window opens. What do you plan to do when it comes to the final game? Just kill the console or switch the end point to win main, for example? Yeah, exactly. Um, and more than likely, I'll probably switch that out on debug builds versus non-debug builds, right? Debug builds, I'll launch a console. Um, non-debug builds, I won't. And in fact, actually, um, what we're, what, what's really going to happen eventually is we're not going to use a console window at all. We're actually going to, um, we're going to have, uh, a logging system that logs to a database, right? Over a network connection. And that'll allow us to, um, not only have logs, but be able to retain them, query them, um, search for patterns, things like that, right? Um, so eventually we're going to set up a, a network log system. Um, and then you won't need the console, right? And that way, even if um, the game happens to crash, um, if we're constantly sending off, firing stuff off to the network, even if the game crashes, you'll still have all of that stuff available to you. And you won't have to sit there and scroll through a console window, right? Switch away from pointers feels good, man. Yeah, uh, that's what we're going to do. Um, I wonder how you'll be able to hide the platform specific entry point on the platform layer. Um, I have some ideas around that. We will cross that bridge when we come to it. Put it that way. Because the, the entry point actually exists in the engine DLL right now, as it is. The, the executable does not contain the entry point. So all it is is just a matter of moving that. Someone mentioned writing, um, writing rather, writing a language 
than before a game engine. I'm kind of doing the former specifically before I do the latter. Awesome. Um, yeah, you love the, the occasional go-to as well. Yeah, it's really good for um, conditions where you have to clean up resources regardless of whether you pass or fail something. Um, and that cleanup code is the same. Go-tos are for, fantastic for that, right? Especially when you don't have um, try-catch, which exceptions I don't use anyways, even if I did have it. But still, yeah, it's it's really good in that scenario. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's on a header. Yeah, so I, like I said, I have ways of getting around that. Okay, so I need to rethink this build tree, especially specifically this this um, build tree, build view tree node children. So. Yeah, because the problem is, is, is uh, ultimately, ultimately, as we do this, when a realloc happens, that winds up being somewhere else in memory. Um, which, co which invalidates all of the um, pointers that we had before. So, what I'm gonna do Let's do Hmm, actually So if I were going to do this by index, right? Right now we have this sort of roots list but what we would also need is an array. We would also need an array of these things and essentially pull from that array. And then we could access it by index. Which is probably the way I should have done it initially. And then the root would just be an index like anything else, right? And then we would just grab that out of the Mm, okay. All right, so instead of actually, we need this to live in the graph view. So remember when I was saying that I created this struct because I didn't know that if we were going to need any more data um, to go along with the graph view itself? Well, now we have that. So what we really need is hierarchy, graph view nodes. We need an array of those. And we're going to call this um, we're just going to call this nodes. And this is going to be a D array. Right? And we're it, it's essentially going to be um, a collective list of all view nodes. And then this, instead of containing a, um, a list of roots, right, this is going to be um, a U32 array um, of root indices, right? Um, and this is going to be an array of indices into the nodes array. And then we're going to set up our hierarchy graph nodes to work the same way. So instead of having a parent pointer, you're going to have a U32 
parent index, right? Um, and so this is going to be an index into ads because we have ads again. <laughs> I felt like we just came out of an ad break, but it is what it is. We get them every 30 minutes on Twitch. So we have to pause for it because we don't want you guys missing content. Uh, let's see. Audrey, I do see your question over on uh, the YouTube side. I'll answer that in just a second um, because I actually do have uh, some thoughts about that, but I don't want the Twitch folks to miss it, right? So um, hang tight for a minute, uh, literally a minute, um, and I will answer that. In the meantime, feel free to hydrate. Andre, sorry, I mispronounced that. I read it as Audrey. Dyslexia hit me hard there. Or is it Andre? <laughs> I probably just butched it three times in a row. Sorry about that. <laughs> but yes, I will answer your question in just a second. I can't win. Yeah, I'm terrible at pronouncing things sometimes. It's just the way it is. All right, and ads are dead. Okay, so Andre, or is it Andre? I'm not sure. Let's go with Andre. Um, so, so you were asking, what do you think? Is OpenGL dead? Or does it make more sense to use Vulkan for game dev pet projects? So I'm gonna answer the OpenGL being dead part first, right? OpenGL is not dead. OpenGL is deprecated not to be confused with obsolete, right? Those are two very different concepts. Deprecated means that it is no longer going to be updated, right? It is not being developed by um, the standards committee. It's not gonna be enhanced anymore. Um, driver development is not gonna continue um, from vendors, right? So it still exists, it still works. It's very much usable, right? It's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's been around so long that all kinds of stuff would break if they got rid of it, right? So that's not gonna happen. It is deprecated, it is not obsolete. Obsolete would mean that, um, you know, don't use it anymore because uh, things are gonna break, right? Um, it's, it's not at that point. What I think is going to happen, and I think what's already started to happen, is OpenGL is essentially going to just become an abstraction layer. And eventually uh, vendors are going to basically pull out the OpenGL bits within the driver and they're gonna replace those with a Vulkan or DirectX or what have you, depending on platform, right? And there's gonna be a translation layer that exists under OpenGL that just calls Vulkan or DirectX or whatever instead. Um, and the thing that you get there is you still get the OpenGL API, right? Um, but uh, it's instead calling that that separate API underneath, underneath the hood, right? So there are performance concerns with that eventually, right? Um, but again, that is probably more of a long-term thing than, than in the short term. And even so, I think for backwards compatibility, I don't see them outright removing it anytime soon. It would just break too many things uh, at this point. So um, if you're learning graphics programming and you're trying to understand the concepts behind graphics programming um, and you've not had a lot of experience with C or you've not had a lot of experience with uh, Vulkan or whatnot, Learning OpenGL can be valuable from the perspective of understanding some of the concepts behind graphics programming in general. And it allows you to stand that up and try things very easily. Now there are features that aren't gonna be available like ray tracing, for example, right? Uh, there may be extensions and stuff, but like core OpenGL doesn't really have that, right? Um, and that's just gonna continue to be true as, as new things come out and these other APIs that OpenGL just isn't going to get, right? But in terms of understanding the basics, there's nothing wrong with learning OpenGL. But I would say the asterisk to that is once you have that understanding and once you're able to be proficient, at some point you're gonna to wanna to jump from OpenGL to um, one of these newer APIs, whether it's DirectX 12, Vulkan, or Metal, um, or all three ideally, right? 
Um, but you're you're essentially going to want to um, jump to those new APIs because that is where the future is. That is being developed, and uh, that is the direction that everything is going. Right. So I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Just pronounce their name as incorrectly as possible. <laughs> Isn't that what Asmongold does? At least he did it when he was playing Final Fantasy, right? Um, you kind of wouldn't mind that, honestly. Immediate OpenGL is fun, and f it's fun to fool around with. Yeah, exactly. Immediate mode uh, OpenGL is fun to fool around with, for sure, right? It's great for prototyping things. Um, in fact, my uh, my small editor that I'm working on on the side is using OpenGL right now um, just because it's quicker to stand up. I'm going to convert it to Vulkan afterwards, but it's a lot easier to prototype you know, stuff with OpenGL. Okay. So, uh, thanks for the comprehensive response. Yeah, no problem. Um, I tried to be as informative as, as possible there. <laughs> okay. So, um, this is going to be an index into uh, the views nodes array. Um, invalid ID if no parent. All right. And then um, the children are going to be um, an array of indices into the views list of uh, the views nodes array. All right. And so uh, looks like did the music die? I think it did. Yeah. Let's uh, just restart it. I think I need to download a new version of that because some of the files I think got corrupted at some point. Anyway, um, so instead of uh, having pointers or, uh, or flat out owning the uh, child objects in this way, uh, we are going to say U32 children, right? It's gonna be an array of those things. Um, and so we're going to uh, reference these things by index into this nodes array, right? That's probably the way I should have done it um, initially. All right, so when we build the tree, um, we are now not going to have um, just the roots array, right? We're going to do uh, out view, um, and we're going to have nodes, and that's going to be dArray creates. Actually, I could just take this, why is it, why does it keep deleting it? Visual, go to the end of the line, okay. Must have been hitting C instead. Anyway, so um, out view is now going to have uh, root indices um, as DRA creates U32. I think that's what it was, wasn't it? Root indices. Why is this bleating? I did that in the in the view, out view. Root indices. Must have spelled it wrong. All right. Um so now what we're going to have is essentially um, just a list of nodes that we pull from, right? And we'll just take the address of those things. So um, we probably ought to have a, uh, a little bit of a convenience function. So we're going to say static void. Um, actually, let's do U32. And we're going to do a, we're going to do a creation for one of these hierarchy nodes. So we're gonna say um, hierarchy 
node create. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to say the, uh, we're going to take the K handle and we're going to have a, uh, a node handle and K handle X form handle. And we're going to, we're going to also take U32 parent index. Um, and we're always going to default the children to just be uh, non-existent and we'll add to it if we need to. So um, we'll do, we'll basically just take this. In fact, I'm going to take this as it is. Right, um, and I'm just going to rename this to node. I don't know why it only did some of it, but okay. Um, and instead of that, we're going to do, um, we're going to change that to use node handle and X form handle. And then um, parent index. Right, so we're going to create that. Uh, I think this needs to actually be parent index. Right, so we're going to create that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say U32. Um, and we're only ever going to create nodes here, I think. So um, we're going to say U32 node account equals D array length and oh we actually need the tree here uh, so hierarchy um, view graph view view All right so we need that um, we need the length of the view nodes array right uh, and the reason that we need that Actually, we, we can get that afterwards. We can push to it first. So we can say DRA push um, view nodes. We're going to push to it node. Right? Then we'll get the node count. And then we're going to return node count minus one. And that will give us the index. Right? So we're always just going to insert new nodes at the end. Um, we don't have to worry about um, nodes being destroyed or returned at the moment. Um, because we're reconstructing the tree all the time. So I think um, it makes sense for us to just rebuild the tree every single time something changes, so that way we don't have to worry about this, right? So um, when we do the build tree, um, in this case, what we're going to do is um, we will do uh, u32 root index equals hierarchy node create, right? And then we're going to take uh, the out view. We're going to take the graph node handles, sub i. And we're going to take the graph x form handles, sub i. And then for parent index, we're going to do invalid id because it is a root, right? So that will return to us the root index, which would have been created here. Okay. So we have that. Um, and then in the build or in the uh, tree node children, let's go to the definition and we're going to do U32 parent index. All right. Um, and then here, we get rid of the uh, address of operator because we don't need that. And we're going to say root index. Pass that through, right? And then um, we need to push this to the roots list. So we actually need to move this. Well, let me think about this for a second. So yes, OK. So we actually need to push this to the roots list. So we need. Um, and we can do this, I guess, afterwards. We can say uh, outview root indices. 
we're going to pass root index, right? Um, and then the parents, uh, did we do the parent index up here? Yeah, we did. Okay, so we don't need that. We actually don't need any of this stuff. So all we do is we create the, the node, recurse through, create its children, right? And then add to the roots list. Now, our, our function up here is basically gonna wind up doing the same thing, right? So I'm actually just gonna put this here. Um, we need to actually move this up because it's defined. It needs to be defined before we actually use it, right? Um, and in this case, uh, let's see. So we have uh, if the parent indices equals parent node handle handle index. Okay. So what we're gonna have to do is uh, we don't have the parent. Um, we don't have a pointer to the parent yet. So we have to get that. So we're gonna say hierarchy graph graph view node pointer parent equals the address of. Um, and we're going to do, um, let me think about this for a second. So graph view nodes sub parent index, right? Um, now, if we build children, let me just make sure that I'm doing this correctly here. Yeah, okay, so if we, if we are doing the construction of the children, we grab a pointer to the parent by using the index, which should be sufficient for our purposes here. We check the handle index. We check to see if the parent has a children array. If it, if it does not, then we create that array, right? Which is now U32s. Um, Smooth, thank you for the, uh, the follow. Um, <laughs> Automod was like, nah, yeah. And yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, it looks like it expired too. Like, I guess there's a timer on it. So um, I will read it anyways, though. Um, Soul Foam. Um, OpenGL is really the only go-to cross-platform API you can currently use. Well, no, not really. Vulkan, right? Um, because there is a, a translation layer to metal that exists. So that's not 100% true. Um, the API is rubbish. However, uh, realistically, for indies making their own games and such, Vulkan is overkill. Yeah, what I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, I do like WebGPU's API, but so far my experience with both implementation... Dawn and the Rust web GPU C conversion are really bad and unoptimized. That's not surprising. It's brand new. Um, excited for web GPU. If it can get off the ground, it's really uh, the simple, clean API. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, which, uh, by the way, thank you for the follows, guys. I appreciate that very much. Um, Taxmandu and Shiroke. Um... Sad Radish 420 I'm new to your stream. It's really cool seeing you use the tools you use effortlessly to make these edits. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for the uh, stretch redeem. I appreciate that as well. Um, yeah, so uh, it's taken me quite a while to get this, this proficient with Vim, but it was worth it, I think. Hydrate redeem. Appreciate that. I'll take that as well. Okay. Um, so the next thing that we're doing here is um, let's rename this from root index to node index, right? Because we're not doing a, a, a root anymore. Um, so we need, uh, I think, the address of um, graph view. Um, Okay, so that should cover us there, except for the parent index is now need, needing to be passed through here. So we pass that through. Um, so we create that node. We have its node index. Build tree, 
node children, so um, we need the node index here to recurse down through that. And then we add to the um, children list, right? So this is going to be, instead of that, it's going to be parent children, and we want uh, node index. Uh, which means we can get rid of all of this. Uh, let's see, did we... Oops, that should be parents. Oops. Alright. So it should be parent children. And now we're operating all with indices into that array. So now even if it gets realloc, it should be fine. I don't feel like we've got everywhere updated that we need to, though. Uh, oh, yeah, the destruction is a thing. Yep. So let's see. Um, destroy tree view tree node. Um, so with the view... Why do we need the view, actually? Do we use the view anywhere in here? I don't think we actually do. This is just destroying a individual node, so I don't think we actually even need that, right? I think we can just do that. And then uh, destroying the node, um, we're gonna do, oh, you know what? I do actually need that. Let me bring that back. Um, so let's see there's two ways we can do this we could either pass the node in by a pointer which is probably fine in this case because we're destroying right so um, we could do We could do hierarchy graph view node pointer child. All right, I guess I could just say, yeah, we'll, we'll do child equals the address of. Uh, I do see the pet redeem, soul foam. I will get to that in just a second. Uh, let's see, we have the child is going to be uh, the address of view nodes sub node children uh, wait a minute yes sub i did I get that right? I think so yeah and then uh, here be past child. Okay. And then we destroy node children, which is just the indi indices into that. That should be good. And then the tree itself. Um, so if view root indices, um, then we need root indices. We loop through that, and we're essentially going to do this. Right, so I'm just going to copy pasta that, change this to root, right? Um, and then this is going to be view root indices sub i. And then we pass root, right? And then we destroy view root indices and set that to zero. All right, did we get everything? We did not. Hmm, okay. 
So update view tree node. Okay, so we're gonna have to update all of this stuff to work with indices too. Not a huge deal. Not a huge deal. Um, okay. So I'm guessing we forward declared this one somewhere. Must be in the header. Okay, so we'll have to update that as well. Um, hmm. Okay. U32 node index. Um, and so the first thing that we'll have to do is if node index equals youth um, invalid ID return. It's a nice easy way to uh, short circuit that. Um, this is going to bleat because of the header. So we'll do um, hierarchy graph h. Do we have... Oh, it's not in the header file. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, conflicting types. Build view tree, destroy view tree. Hmm. Update tree view. Okay. I'm not sure what other types it's finding. Update tree view node. It is in the hider. I was just tripping apparently. All right. This should be U32 node index. Which is going to be a little bit interesting if we ever call that externally. But okay. Um, so the next thing that we need to do is say. Um, Hierarchy view graph node node equals address of graph view nodes node index. Right? That allows this to run. And then um, we have to look at the node parent, right? Um, and go from there. We're going to have ads here in a second. So I think, um, yeah, no, I know, I know about the pet redeem. Um, so we have ads coming. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab, oh, okay. I have one sleeping right here actually. So I will, <clears throat> I will grab her, um, on the ad break. I don't think, maybe I'll get the dog instead, <laughs> instead of the kitty. Um, yeah, so I, I do have a dog. I don't know where she is. She's probably downstairs, but I, I think I can call her. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to wake up the kitty. <laughs> wake her up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go get the, uh, the dog on the next ad break. That, that'll be a good time for me to do it. That way I can uh, show her on stream. Cause I don't think she's been on stream yet, actually. Make them, make them earn their keep. She needs to earn those greenies. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, yeah, Kitty is awake, but I've I've pretty much put her on stream for every redeem. Molly has not been on on the stream, so I think uh, I think that's what I'm going to do this time around. All right. Um, So, 
if node parent index is not equal to invalid ID, then we're going to do this stuff, right? All right, perfect. We have ads. So I'm going to go get the doggy. I will be right back. Doggy acquired. So as soon as the ads finish up, I will uh, see if I can get her on the camera. <laughs> Should be interesting. <laughs> you have no ads? Yeah, you only get ads if uh, there's a slot available uh, to be filled. You can hear the pause on the floor? Yeah, probably. She's right here. She's not exactly a, a light walker all the time either. <laughs> You're a mad lad for doing this in C. Tip my hat to you. I appreciate that. Thanks. All right. Almost done with ads. In fact, I hit the ads button a little bit late, so I can actually kind of cut that off. Um, yeah, I'll just give it the three seconds, whatever. All right. Uh, so let me switch to camera only. There we go. All right. Uh, this should be interesting because she's not small. Ugh. Ugh. There we go. So this is Molly who's probably deeply terrified and confused. Um, she is uh, a rescue. She's about seven years old, I think. Seven, right around there. Um, she's a sweetheart of a dog, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna, here, sit down. But yeah, we got her and uh, we rescued her. She actually had um, 10 puppies, believe it or not. So um, everybody wanted the puppies, nobody wanted the mama dog. So we took the mama dog and she's super sweet. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've had her for most of her life at this point. And, uh, yeah, this is her. Yeah. Six and a half to seven years, something like that. Yeah. So this is Molly. She's super adorable. She knows it. And she's also highly confused cause I never pick her up and hold her this way, but scratchies make up for it. Okay, and you're really heavy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and now she's pogging off and going and getting one of her toys, so. I just made her evening by picking her up, apparently. All right. Yeah, yeet, exactly. Your dog weighs 27 kilograms. That's pretty heavy. Yeah, she's not that heavy, but she's like super, super awkward because she fidgets. But yeah, she's a great dog. Um, she's very well behaved most of the time. <laughs> Nine out of 10 would pet. Yeah, she'd love it too. Uh, she loves belly rubs. She loves scratchies of any kind. Um, and she, she loves people. She loves getting pets for sure. She's a really friendly dog. She doesn't like she doesn't like getting picked up as well. Yeah, uh, Molly just gets confused by it because I never pick her up. So she's like, "Wait, what are we doing?" <laughs> but yeah, uh, so thank you for the uh, the pet on stream, redeem. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. We're reinventing the bicycle. Yes, more or less. Um, quick question. I've worked with JavaScript for about three years now. Does it stress you out at all when working on it? Uh, yeah, all the time because of its weirdness. Especially if you have 
uh, the same code that has to work with Node and the browser, um, then it gets really hairy sometimes. Not my ideal working um, working conditions as far as that, but yeah. All right, so where were we? Um, we just basically need to convert this stuff over to to work with, uh, let's see, node parents. So this is going to be, uh, this is going to be view, uh, the actually the address of graph view nodes sub um, node parent index. All right, so that gives us the parent. Um, and then we can just say parent x form handle, which is going to conflict with this down here. So we'll we'll address that um, in a second. Um, okay. So parent x form handle. Actually, we may not have to address that. We'll see. Uh, so we check the handle to see if it's if it's valid. Um, if the handle is invalid, then we try to walk up the tree to get one that is valid. So um, we start off with this. Um, I'm going to actually take this because I'm going to need it again. Um, so if that's invalid, the next thing we're going to do is grab um, grab its parent, right? So um, we'll do a, uh, a U32. I don't think we can say, can we say parent index? I don't think we've used that yet. Yeah. Parent index uh, equals um, parent, parent index. Um, and then we can do parent equals graph view nodes parent index, right? Uh, so that gets rid of that. And then we say if parent um, then we check its um, X form handle, right? So we just update the X form handle from there. Um, if we do not have a parent, then we use an invalid handle. Then we come down here, we check to say, do we have a valid handle or not? If we still have an invalid handle, then that means there is no parent with a transfer anywhere up the tree. Just use the local. Otherwise, we get the parents world matrix based off of the handle that we have. Multiply that against our local to get the world matrix. If the parent index was invalid ID to begin with, we do that as well. Um, we just say the world is local. Um, we set the matrix. Uh, let's see, the world matrix here. So that doesn't need to change. And then if no children, so we recurse the children. Um, and this should just require a node index, right? So we can say node children sub i, and we don't need the address of that. We just pass the number. Okay. Next issue. Um, so hierarchy graph update. So this is going to be root indices, right? Um, and we're going to update the transforms. So roots have no parent, so no matrix is passed. Okay, so the update takes a node index, right? So this should be root indices sub i without the address of. And I think that's it. Let's build and find out.
Can't you just do pure JS on both? The server doesn't have a DOM or sometimes not even fetch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, there's differences. And, and like, um, you know, you have things like window timeout versus timeout from Node. It's like, it's really, there's a lot of differences between the two and it's super annoying. I would have, I, I think it would have been better if Node just kind of like emulated the browser's API. Right, and just kind of stuck to that instead of having its own types and its own way of doing things. All right, uh, so let's run. And I'm actually going to get rid of these breakpoints. And let's just run and see what we get. Hey, what do you know? We run and no errors. How about that? <laughs> um, so that's pretty cool. We've got that figured out. Um, so we've got our skybox, which gave us our radiance map, which is awesome. We have uh, our terrain. We have the ability to um, move our, our, our meshes around. So the next thing is gonna be directional light, actually. And that's gonna give us our shadow maps back. Uh, let's see. Random question, which state are you from? Question just popped into my mind because I love looking at Google Maps. <laughs> Don't mean to be a creep. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, I'm in South Carolina. That's as much as I'll say, but yeah. Um, all right, so uh, next thing we're going to do is directional light. So we have this skybox attachment done. Let's go back to scene loader. So we need to add another attachment. All right, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this guy. and do a dir light attachment. Dir light attachment. Oops, back one more. Um, we'll do the same here. Dir light attachment, dir light attachment. Um, so the attachment type is gonna be Directional light. Attachment data is going to be directional light. Um, oops. Uh, we're going to do dir light typed mesh attachment. Dir light typed mesh attachment. Uh, oh, I need to change the type on this. Directional lights. All right, so um, directional light has basically these properties over here. So uh, color, um, and this is going to be um, vector for create. And uh, I'm actually just going to delete all of this. And we're gonna do uh, 80, 80, uh, 70, and 1.0 for alpha, right? Um, so that's our color, uh, the direction is gonna be, uh, let's see, I think that's also a vector four, yep. So vec, for creates right, and that's going to wind up being 0.1f negative uh, 1.0f uh, 0.1 oops 0 0.1 uh, and 1.0 
right? So we've got a direction there. Um, next thing is shadow distance. So that we're going to just set to 100. Uh, the next thing is going to be shadow fade distance is going to be 5. And shadow split multiplier is going to be uh, 0.75 f, right? So uh, we've got all that. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. We attach that to the environment node. I think uh, we should be good to go. I seem to recall that there was something with directional lights we are going to have to change. So we're going to see, we're going to see how that works. Uh, for now, I'm just going to try running it and seeing what I get. But I suspect there was some stuff that was missing. All right, so let's load. Oh, nope. Works right out of the box. How about that? Okay, well, that wasn't hard. Um, I think there was the, the stuff I was thinking about was mostly revolving around... Um, supporting multiple directional lights, which the shader doesn't support and I'm not going to worry about right now. I think I like maybe put a to-do. Um, so just to test this out, uh, I'm going to select the tree and just kind of move him around. Shadow map updates as it should. Uh, cool beans. All right, uh, we can rotate the car. Yeah, looks pretty good. Can't complain. Okay, so that's that. I wonder if uh, point lights will wind up being the same thing. Uh, did we put the point lights in here? I don't know if we did. We did not. Okay. So the point lights. Um, the point lights I'm actually going to do as attachments to, oh, you know what? Let's put, let's put some point lights and attach it to the Falcon, right? And then just move around. That's what it was that it was point lights that needed work, not, um, not the directional light. I mean, the directional light to support multiples and stuff like that is, is one thing, but like, um, it was point lights that I was thinking of. So, okay. And now I remember why I didn't do point lights in here. Um, let's see. Do we want to bite that off tonight? I guess we could. So, if we open up the old scene file, the way that we set up our directional light, or our point lights rather, was we had like a color um, constant linear quadratic, that's fine, right? But the other thing that we had in here was position, which doesn't really make sense, right? Um, Point lights really, really should, like their position really should be based off of a transform um, because we're going to want to move them around a the scene um, and we shouldn't have to be like reaching into the point light and uh, and like managing its its position directly. So um, the way that we're going to have this work, or at least the way that I'm thinking about making this work, is the point light will still have the position property in code, but it's going to obtain the X, Y, Z portion of that, right? Because we actually have this as a vector four um, for data alignment purposes in the shader. We're going to obtain the X, Y, Z uh, of that and set that based on the nodes transform that owns it, right? Um, and maybe this might make, this might even make sense for us to have 
maybe the point light itself should have a transform, right? So maybe, and, and this is the part I haven't fully thought out yet. So maybe let's 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 think about this in in terms of um, of this file, right? So uh, we'll have we could either do it as as a child object, or like if we want to attach a light to this, maybe it makes sense to say type equals point light. Um, so we'll do our color, um, which it's a vector for, so we're gonna have to do this as, as a string for now. Uh, so let's do, um, I guess it doesn't really matter like what we do here. Uh, I guess let's say we do a 100.0, right, for, for red. We want a red light, so we're gonna say zero for blue. Um, or zero for green and blue. Um, and then 1.0 for our alpha slash intensity, whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't know that we're actually going to use the alpha for anything. We might use that to like pack in some other data eventually, but we'll call it that for now. Um, the other thing that I want to do is refactor this a little bit um, because we have this constant F, right? which is always 1.0. Um, and that's used to um, calculate like the fall off of the light. Um, and so we should probably make that a little bit more user friendly. Uh, we have a linear property. Um, so we'll call that 0 0.35. And then we also have the quadratic, right? Um, and that's 0 0.44. Um, and so all of these together uh, give us our light attenuation. And I'm thinking that we might want to maybe come up with a different way of representing this, but for now we'll, we'll just get it to work as is. Um, so I'll set one of those up and here's the thing though. So if we do, if we do a position, or I should say, if we do a transform, right? A transform is position, rotation, scale. Point lights don't have a rotation, right? It doesn't make sense to rotate a point light because it's a point in space and light radiates in all directions around that. So rotation would basically just be ignored. Scale also doesn't make sense because you don't scale a point in space, right? Um, now you could argue that well, maybe that would affect the fall off, but really you should be just affecting the fall off, right? You should adjust these parameters. So maybe what we do, maybe we keep the position, right? And that position is relative to whatever it's attached to, right? So it could be relative to the node that it's attached to, if it has a transform, or if it doesn't have a transform, then it recurses up the tree to try and get one or uses an identity matrix, right? And then it just multiplies that position by that. Maybe that makes more sense. Now, if we, if and when we go to put spotlights in, that will need a transform because that will have a position and, and a rotation, which I think makes sense. Um, so the question is, do we want them to work differently or do we want them to work the same? Because technically we don't need the whole transform, but you know we could just say that maybe it does have a transform, so you could move it around. But the scale and rotation do nothing. With the point light, you just need the position, though. It doesn't make much sense to also hold rotation and scale. Yes, but a eventually for the directional light we're going to have the ability to rotate that in space to give you the direction right so that you don't have to um do that using text and figure out a, a quaternion rotation right um so maybe it'll put like a gizmo in the center of the scene or something like that um that you can move and so i'm kind of like i'm thinking that 
we might want to use a transform because then we can use the gizmo to move it around as well. Even though it's not going to use those other properties, maybe it makes more sense to do it that way. Um, you could support hex values for colors in case, and that's not a bad idea. It's better to grab what you need from the node. Well, so, okay, so that's where I'm going to disagree when it comes to point lights. Because think about this, for example, right? You've got a car that has two taillights. So you'd want two point lights for that, right? One on each side of the car. So you need the ability to offset that. Now, you could say, in order to do that, you need to create a new node with a light attachment on it. And maybe it works that way, right? But wouldn't it also make sense to just be able to do this on the actual light itself? Maybe. Directional light will work the same, but instead of storing the position, you, you store the rotation. Yeah. For the spotlight, you store position and rotation. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's relative position, right? But you have to consider too, I mean, ultimately it's gonna be multiplied by a transformation matrix anyways, right? Because as the car moves and rotates, you're gonna be moving that point along with it. Um, we could go either way on it, right? It could be a relative position, you're right. Um, that relative position is going to take scale into account though. From, you know, the scale of whatever it's attached to. So I guess the lower barrier to entry here is to just do position, right? I suppose we could always... All we get here is a more elegant API. Well, what we would get out of having a an X form is the ability to be able to move that um, in the scene, right? Even though it's attached to the car, you would be able to... Um, you know, change your gizmo to local mode and be able to move it locally to itself, right? Or I should say relative to its parent. Just like, um, so for example, right, the the tree is a child of Sponza, right? So if I rotate the Sponza, right, the tree goes with it. But then if I also want to move the tree relative to that, I should be able to do that. And then select the Sponza again and rotate. And it should stick to it, right? So that's what I mean. Like, you should have the ability to sort of have that relativity. Why wouldn't that work with relative position? It could, right? It's just the gizmo right now expects an X form, right? It expects an X form to be able to sync with, right? It's not, it's not going to work with just a position at the moment. I would have to sort of refactor the gizmo to say, okay, well, for this one thing that we're editing, only take into account position and don't allow trans uh, changing to the other modes, which is something we could do. The relation stays the same no matter if X form or position. Yes, that's not really the issue, right? It's more of a usability slash code friendliness issue, I guess. Made by Arimu, thank you for the uh, the follow. Appreciate that, welcome. Does that make sense though? Because like, if I were to put an X form on that, technically speaking, we could make this light selectable. Although right now it wouldn't be because we don't have anything to actually click on. Would we need that in the future anyways? I would say yeah, right? Because you're gonna have, um, like let's say that you I don't know, let's say that you have a, um, 
Well, I guess the, the the car is a really good example, right? It's 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 it would be really easy to to go in there and and configure it that way. Ads. Ads. Uh, the pro, thank you for the subscription over there on the. Uh, the YouTube side that does help me a lot, actually. Um, all the follows and subs definitely um, help me out, so I really appreciate uh, any of those on on um, on both sides, right? Because uh, that helps me grow the channel, right? It helps me get visibility and helps me reach more people. So um, that definitely helps. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I enjoy JavaScript more when, while having these streams open. open. Um, fun to listen to, especially this one. I appreciate that, the pro. Thank you. I'm glad you're liking it. From like you just finished video 69. It was great. It's a good video to finish on. Ads are done at least for you. Yeah. Um, we've got about 15 seconds, I think, for everybody else. Potentially. few more seconds all right cool so I think what I'm gonna do for now I'll keep the position because that's the lowest barrier to entry that is what we already have in place so I'll stick with that for now um, so 7.0 and then uh, if we need it in X form later um, with the ability to uh, you know grab point lights and move them around which eventually we are going to want we'll change it at that point um, cause this, that's, I guess it's a little bit out of scope, um, for this set of changes, right? Um, okay. So we have a point light here. It's red. We have all of our properties. So let's just go with this way for now. And we can always change it as like a separate to do item in the feature. Oh, your, fro your phone froze and you lost the discussion. That sucks. Yeah, um, so basically just to recap, I'm going to go with the position for now just because that's already what's in place. Um, I'll just have to, you know, make it work relative to the node that it's attached to, but that's not a huge deal. Um, and then in the future, when we want the ability to actually move it around, like select it and move it around the scene, um, we'll handle that separately. Because uh, I think... For that, we're actually going to need like a billboard that exists in there that we can actually click because you need something to click and you can't click like just a point in space. Like there's no way to really reliably do that. So um, we're going to need that um, as a prerequisite to be able to select the light to move it in the first place. So, all right. Um, so we have the point lights that should be relative to which this, if it's relative to the car, it's going to like spawn somewhere ridiculous probably, but that's fine because it was global before. But I'm just going to add the, just the one for now um, and we'll go from there. So over here, we need to essentially just do the same thing. Um, in fact, I'm actually, I'm not going to do it here. I'm going to go to the Falcon and I'm going to do a scene node attachment config and we'll do Falcon red light attachment and we'll just zero the whole thing out to begin with and we'll say Falcon red light attachment type equals attachment type um, point light, um, Falcon red light attachment, attachment data equals K allocate size of, oops, size of scene node attachment, um, point light. And the memory tag will be scene. All right. 
Uh, and then we can do, whoops. Scroll be way down for some reason. I think I hit the wrong button. All right, so um, we need scene, node, attachment, um, point light. And we're gonna do falcon, red, light, light, um, typed attachment. And we're gonna set that equal to um, falcon red light attachment, attachment data. Then we'll do um, falcon typed attachment um, and we're going to do color and I'm actually just going to cheat and do actually you know what I'm going to do this right um, so paste this Oops. And one more time. All right, and then um, this is going to be vec for create. Um, that's going to be just 1.0f, 35f, 44f, and then vec for creates again, uh, convert these to uh, to that. Do the same up here. Um, delete that one. Okay. So we have the properties set. Uh, oh, we need semicolon there. All right, so we have that. And then I'm just going to copy this one. Then we'll actually attach it. Falcon red light attachment. Okay. That looks mostly correct to me. Now, I realize that uh, this is not like taking into account the parent uh, or the node transform or any of that stuff yet. I just wanna see if the light spawns. And it did. We can actually see the redness in the shadow there. It's right there. Okay, so um, it has spawned, but it's not relative to the car. So we'll need to go over to scene. And let's see, how do we want to handle this? So, Scene node initialize and scene type directional lights, point light. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> so we do have the position, which is kind of the global position, but we need to maintain an offset in the actual attachment itself, right? Um, now, what gets loaded into the shader is this data, right? So that's the point light data. That's what actually gets passed off to the shader. So um, ultimately, that's what we're going to want, um, where we're going to want to store the final position. Uh, the light itself the light itself we have uh, a name, a generation, light data and debug data. So what we can do is 
we can see, and this is probably where we'd store the transform even. But we'll go with position. So we'll say um, vec for position, right? And this is going to be the positional um, offset from whatever this may be attached to. Right, um, whoops. And then uh, the data itself. is going to be the, oh, the position of the light in the world. Right, okay, so that makes sense. So what we can actually do here um, is instead of setting the position here for this, um, we set the base object's position. Set the base position, not the world position which will be calcul calculated on update, right? And then, um, let's see. Then what we can do we can get the node that it's attached to, get its transform, multiply that value by the transform. And then we should be good. So what that's gonna mean, well, we may need to traverse up the tree to find one too, right? Okay. So, let me think about how, where's the best place to do that? Is that a scene specific thing? Probably. So we're already updating point light debug boxes anyway which actually is going to be completely wrong at this point. Um, oh yeah, we're not even rendering these things because we haven't converted those over to use. Like, I know this says X form, but it's actually a transform, I think. Yeah. So we haven't even converted the debug boxes to use the new transform system yet, which is part of the... Pr that's a separate issue. So... Let's do update the point lights data position, world position, to take into account the owning nodes transform. So, uh, let's see, we'll have to do, scene attachment, point light attachment, um, is equal to, oops, scene, point light attachments, sub i and we want the address of that, right? Um, the point light attachment, we can then allow us to get the hierarchy node handle. So we can say um, scene hierarchy uh, node handles at that index, right? So uh, hierarchy node handle, handle index. 
Uh, Gets, thank you for the uh, the follow. I appreciate that. All right, so uh, let's see. So this is going to be k handle node handle is that so we have the node and then k handle x form handle equals scene hierarchy x form handles node handle uh whoops not node handle uh Wait a minute. Hierarchy node handle. Do we have we should probably put some some convenience functions in here instead of having to access these arrays directly. All right, so we, we have the node handle. Do we actually, we don't actually need this is the xform handle. Right. Okay. So we can get that using the hierarchy node handle handle index, right? So those arrays line up um, from the X form handle. Uh, if X form handle uh, K handle is invalid. Uh, and actually, if if it's not invalid, uh, we'll say then uh, x form world get x form handle. That's going to give us um, a matrix, right? So we'll say mat for world. So this will set uh, world equals that. Otherwise, world equals x form. Actually, we'll just do mat for identity. And then I'll say to do traverse tree to try and find a node with a transform. Uh, a parent. Actually, it would be an ancestor node. Right? So right now, I'm not going to bother with that. So we get the uh, the world matrix. And then we do vec4 mole mat4. So the vector is going to be um, scene point lights sub i dot position, right? Uh, the mat four is going to be world, and the result of that is going to be scene point lights sub i data position. So we'll calculate world position for the point light. Okay, that should give us relative point light position. Dingus alarm, please read. Yeah, what did I do? Uh, let's see. How long are you going to stream today? Um, probably going to be ending soon, actually. Uh, let's
let's see. You might only want to do relationships on X form, else you have to check all the time. Yeah, and that's kind of like we might we might want to set up some rules around that, like what a light can be, what a point light can be attached to, right? Otherwise, I'm gonna to have to do all of this stuff all of the time. Yeah, which isn't great, right? Um, it's fine for a small scene, but if we have a bunch of those lights, it's going to get out of control. Although, that being said, um, we're never going to have... I'm not going to allow a lot of dynamic point lights in a scene, ever. Just because those are expensive, especially when we have shadow mapping coming from those things. Point light with point light children. Theoretically, it could could be allowed, Right? As a point light cluster. Yeah. So you could have a situation where you have like a point light in the middle. And then you have like six point lights around it. And maybe the middle one spins and the other lights spin around it. And light the room that way. Like I could see something like that being a thing. But you might also want to set up a series of nodes for that. Right now it can't be relational. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, and so I might... Like right now it's an attachment, right? Um, maybe as opposed to an attachment, maybe it winds up being like a special node type. But that feels clunky to me, so I don't know. Now it can't be relational because you get the parents transform. It can't relate to other point lights. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you can't have a point light with point light children. And I think I'm okay with that. If you need that, you should probably be using nodes. I think I'm okay with that. Um, at least for now. Maybe we enhance it in the future. But yeah, I totally get what you're saying. I just don't know that we're gonna need that necessarily in a way where it can't be done with nodes. Uh, you gotta get off soon too. Thanks for streaming. It's been really nice to see someone work just work their way through code like this. Awesome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, by the way, I, I guess I should do a shameless plug, right? If you guys haven't already, follow me in both places on the um, YouTube channel and on, and on Twitch. It helps me, um, you know, grow the the channel. Good luck. HF with your code. I'm um, not understanding what HF is. <laughs> Maybe that's that's me being a boomer, but I don't understand with... I, I understand the G... Oh, have fun. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm booming, boomering it up there. Uh, okay, so I built this. Let me see. Let me see what we get. Let me see if it just screams at me, first of all. Okay, seemingly not. So the next question is... Um, if I select the, all right, I got to move the stupid tree out of the way first. So if I move the car now, it does not look like the lights going with it. So I must have done. Must have done something incorrectly there. Because it looks like it did it initially, but now when I'm updating it, it doesn't look like it did. Um, unless this code is just not working correctly, which is possible. Oh, that's why. Because I put it under the uh, debug data and it does not need to be there. Um, This should be done whether or not there's debug data. Debug box info update. <laughs> dingus, yeah, that was a dingus move for sure. I feel like I need to need to find um, like a 
a family friendly dingus emote of some sort, right? For when I'm being a dingus. All right, so move the tree, select the car, move the car. Hmm. Why is that not updating, I wonder? Okay, so we're looping through point lights. Point light count. Point light attachment sub I. That should be fine. Scene hierarchy X form handles. And we take it from the... Oh, wait a minute. This isn't going to work. Um, wait, isn't that the same thing that I did? X form world get. Let me. I'm pretty sure that's the same thing I did, unless I did a copy pasta. Uh, Zoj... Zoyij? Zoyij? Did I get that right? I hope I did. Uh, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. <laughs> you don't even know what a dingus is. It just sounds funny. A dingus is just, you know... You're just being a dingus, like a fool, you know? Messing around, just... Doing things incorrectly. Just being a dingus. It does sound funny. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so we grab the... It's literally this... Oh, wait a minute. That might be the difference. Scene... Point light attachment indices. Pog. All right. Nope. Still didn't move. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well. If all else fails. Scene update. So let's, let's see. 615. Let's do this. And let's see what we're actually getting here. So, um, we only have one point light. So, the point light attachment, point light attachment indices is going to be zero. That makes sense. Um, the hierarchy handle index so the node is uh let's see the falcon which is going to be two because it's a third object created so that is correct right so the x form handle should be theoretically one more than that three yep okay so we should not have an invalid handle here Right. We get the ads.
That's going to be our last ad break of the night, I think. Fixed point overflow. Good night. Have a good one. Black Magic, thank you, thank you for the uh, follow. Appreciate that. So we're just waiting on ads to finish up. So we've got about uh, 45 seconds left. And then we can continue. Almost done with ads. And ads are dead. All right, cool. So let's get the world matrix for this guy. So our scale looks correct and our position looks correct. So we're getting the correct world matrix. So that's good. So our position should be using our point lights sub I position, right? Which starts off being seven, 125 and 20. All right, um, and so we multiply that by our world matrix, uh, and it should give us that offset position, right? So we should wind up with modified position. So 245.4375.7. I guess that makes sense, more or less, right? Um, it is also shrunk down, so I, I do see where that makes sense. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna put a breakpoint there. I'm gonna take away this one and I'm gonna disable this one. Continue. And then I'm going to move this out quite a lot. Re-enable this guy. So now we should have had a different world matrix. Okay, so um, it moved on the z-axis, which makes sense. That is, yeah, that is the direction they moved it in, yeah. Okay, so um, the data position somehow is exactly the same. Help me understand that. So this position is never going to change. That makes sense, but the data position should absolutely have changed. And I don't feel like it did, like at all. In fact, I'm gonna take a screenshot. Of that. I'm just going to put it right there and I'm going to disable this guy. Continue. Um, 
um, grab this again and move it back. Rename the breakpoint. And take a look at the point lights. Data. Position. It's the same exact position. How is that possible? How is that possible? It's definitely moving on the Z axis. What does the world change when you move the car? So um, it's the world, the world matrix, like the, the cached world matrix, right? Um, so when I move the car, it, it basically is also calculating against any parent transforms it may have. And then I store off that matrix for later use. Um, and I use the world matrix across the board for everything to render it. Um, and so if it doesn't have a parent, it just makes a copy of the local matrix to the world matrix and just uses that. But um, ultimately, what you're going to wind up with is you're, anytime you move an object, even if you move it in local space or you move its parent or whatever, its world matrix is going to change. Um, oh, did... <laughs> It looks like uh, you tried to post a link and like the auto mod just deleted all of your messages, apparently. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, that's a bit baffling to be completely honest. I don't understand why that's not updating. Unless this function is just busted. Which I don't know that I've ever actually used this to be completely honest, so it could be wrong. Let me try. Let me try something super gross and hacky. Vec3 um, pause equals Vec3 um, from Vec4. And I'll take scene point lights sub i position. Right, and then I'll do. Um, I'm going to comment this guy out and then do vec3 transform. Position. Uh, I want 0, 0.0 f for the w component. Um, no, I want 1.0 F. That's right. Um, and then I want VEC4 from VEC3. This will tell me if that other function is messed up because I know this one works. Uh, what is it bleating about? Oh, uh, I need to do that for W. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. Let's just disable that for now. And, oh, interesting. Look what happened. And even my debug data showed up. Hmm. I think that other function might be foobar. So let's move the tree. And let's grab this and move it. Oh, look at that. The light moves along with it now. Okay. So something about that other function is messed up. Because now I can move this around as I would expect. Woo. Um, should we remove one parameter? What do you mean, Diamond? In Vim? Oh, D-A-A. -A. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Is that... A oh, I see what you mean. Uh, it doesn't seem to work. D-A-A? -A? Yeah. Might be your... Yeah, it must be your config. Doesn't seem to be doing anything, actually. It could be your config. If it is, let me know what it actually does. Hmm. Okay. So what I'm going to do, actually. Um, the below method works. The above does not. But why? All right, and I'm just going to leave that. I'm going to put a pin in that for right now. Um, okay. Oh, we don't need this either. Okay. So I think uh, I think this is probably where I'm going to leave it for tonight because we, we made some pretty good progress, right? We figured out some stuff. Um, and we actually have... We actually have a lot more flexibility than we did before with all of this stuff right because now we can actually like attach lights to things which we couldn't do before which is pretty cool um we still have some stuff to do on that but um so let's see uh actually yeah change log let's update this guy right um okay so um Created X form system and replaced transforms. I guess, I guess this was more of a, a series of bug fixes. So I guess I don't really need to put it in the change log. Uh, do we have anything on our to do list that we can cross out um, regarding this? Remove transform from mesh. We already did. I'm pretty sure we did that. Yes, we did. Okay. Um, so replace any and all transforms that X form handles that's in progress. Update systems to use these handles. Um, yeah, so we need to update our a lot of our systems to use handles. That's probably the next big thing that we're going to do. Um, we do need to hook up our, our scene loader, which we're actually ready to do now. Um, because we have, we have that sort of hard-coded array of stuff. 
um, setup or that hard coded uh, tree setup. So I think now we can actually uh, set up our loader. We'll probably do that in the next stream to load up that file format and create that tree for us instead of us programming it all out. Um, because now we know all of the various components that we have um, to load up actually work and can be put in a hierarchy and all that stuff seems to work. Um, I'm gelling first time chat. Welcome. Uh, followed on Twitch for next time. Um, quite a quiet chat on YouTube. Yeah, uh, it is. Um, oh yeah, you did. You did message a few minutes ago. I do only check chat like every 10 minutes or so. Um, and that, and that's on both sides. So yeah, sometimes YouTube gets a little bit quiet. Sometimes Twitch gets a little bit quiet. I've seen it happen on both sides actually. Um, but yeah, I usually check one side and then check the other, but I see your chats over there as well. Um, but yeah, it looks pretty, qu it's been pretty quiet over on that side tonight. It's not always that way, but yeah, I do appreciate the, uh, the follow on both sides though. Um, Okay, so yeah, next time um, we're definitely going to be ready to to start parsing the file and uh, and creating the um, the tree from that. So uh, get status. So these are all the things that we changed tonight. Um, let me just do a quick diff. We were able to check off an item technically that was already done, but you know it's fine. I just want to make sure that there's no sort of weird bananery going on in here. Let's see. I think we're going to be good, though. Just want to make sure I'm not like checking in a bunch of dead code somewhere. We know all that's good. Okay, we put to do's where we need to put them, so I think we're good. Um, get add, right? So um, fix several issues with transform hierarchy and node retrieval. Also finished. Um, Attachment type, uh, which I guess we should say finished init loading for all attachment types. Um, and I guess we could say file loading is next, right? So we're going to finally use our, um, our parser. Okay, cool. So um, with all that said, let me see if I can find somebody to raid. I'm just going to check chat one more time. Um, okay, yeah, I think we're I think we're good. So I'm going to check and see who is uh, available to raid. Uh, let's see. I was kind of hoping Spiro was online. <laughs> um, but I don't think he is. Let me narrow down the selection a little bit. Let me see. All right. Um, maybe I'll raid somebody that I haven't raided before. looking through the list, right? Let's see. Is there anybody doing... I 
I don't really see anything that's kind of the same category of stuff. So I think, I think what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to raid. Uh, let's see, where is it? I'm going to raid Alvea Sanctuary because I think um, I think it's a really good cause. It's a uh, non-profit uh, animal rescue. And uh, they currently have 666 viewers in the channel, which is kind of kind of funny. So I'm going to break that. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, if you haven't already, um, follow me in both places. I would really appreciate it. It helps me grow the channel. Um, and, uh, and on the YouTube side, I will, uh, I will drop a link over there, um, so that you guys can, uh, can see that as well. Um, and yeah, I will, uh, I will see you guys, uh, back here tomorrow. So, all right, see ya. And for those of you on the YouTube side, that is where we're going. Um, all right. And what do you do for a living? Um, I am a, um, well, right now I, I write uh, medical software for a living. My, my job just re recently changed. So I hope that answers your question, but, um, yeah. All right. Uh, anyways, good night.